Call this Board of Supervisors meeting to order. If you'll all please rise for the invocation by Pastor George Carey and stay standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Let us pray. O oh Lord, it is with a degree of thankful hearts that we gather today, knowing that COVID-19 is waning in our city, county, state, nation, and world. We are a thankful people that some degree of normal life is on the horizon. In other matters, we ask for your blessing upon each one of our county supervisors and all the departments of Mojave County. You, O oh God, have blessed our land so tremendously over the years. And as we approach July 4th celebration of our nation, we give you praise. We give you thanks for this still free land to worship and pray to you publicly as we so please. We ask, O oh God, that you give wisdom to each supervisor as they conduct this meeting. Help them to respect and appreciate each other for the sake of their constituents and the unity of their purpose. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Kerry. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Many of your legislative reports, Supervisor Angus. I have nothing this morning. Uh, we haven't had CSA meetings because of the extended budget session, but I'm hoping it will happen soon. Thank you. Right. Supervisor Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I attended the State County Supervisors Association Executive Board meeting, but here locally I attended the uh, Pine Lake Community meeting regarding the flag fire and the uh, possibility of flooding concerns uh, once the monsoons come, and I hope they come soon. I attended the open house of Hope Gardens at Juvenile Detention. Uh, it's a girls rehabilitation program. I did speak at the Memorial Day ceremony here in Kingman, and lastly, I organized a virtual meeting regarding the uh, lowering of the water in uh, the launch area at South Coven Lake Mead. Attending that meeting were uh, State Rep Regina Cobb, Chief of Staff Greg Hamburger, Superintendent Sarah Creechbaum, County Manager Sam Alters, and myself. And um, I think we, we have some good communications going on, and we can help South Cove somewhat. Thank you. Supervisor School? None today, Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Lingenfeld. Thank you, Chairman Johnson. Uh, I believe the House is planning to go to the floor today to vote on the budget. Contained in the budget is a new drought mitigation fund and board uh, currently in the environmental. It's a House Bill 2894. Um, drought mitigation fund and board. The budget establishes the drought mitigation revolving fund. Uh, sets aside $200 million to provide financial assistance for drought mitigation efforts and, and water supply development. The fund would be used for forbearance of water deliveries that would avoid cuts to Arizona's Colorado River water supplies, basically pay farmers not to take their water, grants for the state land department to pump groundwater, build a treatment plant, uh, sell the water at fair market rates to benefit the trust, deliver the water to the Cap Canal for transport to the Pinal end user who pays for the canal use and the water, low cost long term loans for the planning, designing, constructing, or financing of water supply development projects to import water supplies from outside Arizona into this state, and administrative costs create, would create a seven member oversight drought mitigation board comprised of the Department of Water Resources director and six appointed members with a background in water issues within the state for five-year terms, two members from Maricopa, Pima, or Pinal, one member from Yuma, La Paz, or Mojave, one member from Cochise, Graham, Greeley, or Santa Cruz, one from Gila and Yavapai, uh, one from Apache, Coconino, or Navajo, the governor, Senate president, and speaker of the House of Representatives are each to make two appointments that must meet geographic residential requirements. 
the state president, the Senate president, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, and State Land Commissioner are non voting advisory members of that board and it would set aside administration and procedures for the fund, includes a provision that the water study must be conducted that a water study must be conducted prior to development of any infrastructure. Um, thoughts on this, what's being proposed right now is that it's a lot of money and it's very ambiguous. Um, many are not confident that the money proposed will be used um, and go towards new water source development as it should. So this will be one to watch. Uh, also our second meeting of this month, I'm working with High Ground to put together a presentation and a full report on um, this and everything that um, we experienced during the legislative session. Uh, we're failing to get a hearing because of Gail Griffin uh, and what's uh, planned for our water study committee this summer uh, leading up to next legislative session. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. I need a motion to call for an executive session to be held June 21st, 2021 at 9 a.m. So moved. Second. Motion second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. County Manager Elter, do you have a report this morning? Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, board members. A yes, brief one. Um, starting with uh, Mojave County um, was awarded uh, $448,000 by the Federal Highway Administration. Federal Highway is a division of the U.S. Department of Transportation. Uh, this was awarded for a composite arch bridge at Trexton Wash on Ontario's Road. This is to provide for an all-weather drainage crossing. Um, this was really due to the uh, diligence and the effort by the Public Works Department and specifically Steve Latoski who uh, put in an application and shepherded it through. Mojave County was the only county in the nation to receive funding under this grant. Uh, there were six other states that received some funding as well. Additionally, um, Public Works team as a whole and economic development uh, collaborated uh, to and applied for a, a grant to the Arizona Commerce Authority and uh, Mojave County as a result of that application was awarded $250,000 for the Apache Road project. This can go to enhance and supplement the board action of earlier uh, that allocated funds for that project. I just wanted you to um, uh, be, at, I wanted to highlight this information so you're aware of it. Uh, we, we staff uh, really continues to uh, pursue, um, discover and, and uh, experience uh, significant success in, in applying for and uh, obtaining dollars through grants for various projects. So thank you for allowing me to share this info with you. Thank you. We want to call to the public, Chris Fredarte. Good morning, I'm Chris Fredarte from Kingman. I'm a member of the John Birch Society and the Kingman chapter leader. We are a nonpartisan group of Americans who study and follow the Constitution and help educate others. Our mission is to bring about less government and more responsibility, with God's help, a better world. The John Birch Society was founded in 1958 by businessman Robert Welch. Through our educational efforts, it has been estimated that the John Birch Society has stalled the growth of communism in the United States by as much as 50 years. As Birchers, we are committed to saving our country by actively engaging in projects to accomplish that goal. To name a few, we advocate to restore election integrity, protect our Constitution, support local law enforcement, get the U.S. out of the U.N. and rein in big government. We routinely contact our legislators to enact and support bills that are consistent with our Constitution and oppose those which destroy our God-given freedom and liberties. You can go to jbs.org for more information and to apply for membership. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Kenny Works. Kenny Works, Yucca, Arizona. 
I have a book review with a few uh, in, in, inspiring about John Adams, uh, Education of John Adams by R.B. Bernstein, a uh, uh, review is done by Stephen Presser. When his beloved Abigail passed away in 1818, a Adams wrote Jefferson, if human life is a bubble, no matter how soon it breaks, if it is a, as I firmly believe, an immortal existence, we ought to patiently to wait for the instructions of the great teacher. Jefferson wrote back, it is of some comfort to us both that the uh, term is not very distant at which we are to deposit in the same cerement our sorrow and suffering bodies and to ascend in, assess, in ass, essence to an ecstatic meeting with the friends we have loved and lost and whom we shall love and never lose again. The popular conception among scholars that our founding fathers were a collection of deists, ag agnostics, and atheists needs amending. It is not too much then to, deeply to be deeply grateful for this sensitive but realistic and very rich account of Adams and his times. This book shows that for the founding generation there was a prof profound connection between constitutional law, morality, and religion. Bernstein eloquently demonstrates that Adams' professional flaws and his lack of political finesse and popularity pale in comparison to the rich constitutional legacy he left in his nation. Bernstein gave the book this title to recall Adams' great-grandson Henry's a marvelous con conservative reflection on the decline of the country in 19th century. Bernstein reveals little in this fine work of his own political views, though he is anything but a Trump supporter. Yet insofar as Trump is a follower of Adams' favored schemes of the uh, separation of powers and checks, and balances on the power of Washington, D.C., his book may actually be a manual for appreciation of that other irascible and parvenu president. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Stephen Robinson. Good morning, Stephen Robinson, Golden Valley, Arizona. I have a couple, three quick questions about item 10 on the agenda. My first question is, who's responsible for making sure we're not duplicating appointments? Today, Marianne Buckner, who was appointed on April 5th. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Robinson, I don't believe we can go over items that are on the agenda. There we go. It's on the consent agenda. And it's I was on the consent agenda. That's what it specifically says. I remember, right? I plan to cover another question outside the, of the uh, item, but I was, my understanding was that I was to bring this up during the cons this call. If it's public. pulled, you can, you, can just, you can come back up if it's, if it's pulled. So, but we don't know if it will be pulled, so he can go ahead and speak on the item now. Thank you. Once again, you're wrong, Mr. Esplin, but we'll go ahead. Okay, so she was, it's a duplicate, and I'm not sure if the clerk of the board, the chairman of the party, or the district director is responsible for making sure they're not duplicated. The second question is about Anna Admire's removal on that same day, April 5th. She wrote an email to the district director saying she did not want to be removed, yet in fact she was removed by this board even though she didn't sign the form that she had put up of the, that the resignation letter. So I wonder, and there wasn't enough, there was positions open, so I don't know why the district director removed her. Regarding uh, duplications, the third question is, when a person is appointed, like for a specific term, and a gal named a Amy Boggs, a really sweet lady, was appointed on July 5th for the term ending September 30th. That same form was inadvertently submitted on October 5th of last year, the same form saying it ends on September 30th. Yet unfortunately, 
because she was not an elected PC for the current term, and state law requires someone to be an elected PC to be elected to party office. So since all four of the five of you are elected or one appointed PC, I would think you'd be interested in making sure that the county follows the laws. The law is very clear for legislative districts. You have to be an elected PC to be elected to office. It's not quite as clear, but the intent is the same for state committeemen and for uh, legislative districts that a PC be elected before being elected to party office. And I believe that the supervisors would be very interested in making sure that our county party f follows the state law and state statutes. Thank you. Thank you. I need a motion to approve the February 1st, 2021 Board of Supervisors meeting minutes. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. No further discussion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion carries. We have a presentation now. Good morning, Chairman Johnson, members of the board, County Manager Elters, and staff. I just want to start off by thanking you for the support that you've given to the Treasurer's Office related to the tax deed foreclosure process over the past several years and for providing the opportunity to give this presentation this morning. So what I'm going to cover is basically a summary of the last three fiscal years. We started or resumed this process in FY1819. Previous to that, no tax deed foreclosures had taken place in Mojave County for roughly 10 years. So we were facing a significant backlog of parcels that qualified for the process. Um, it's worth noting that there were, there were three objectives to this process. First was to reduce the administrative burden on our office, uh, whether that be dollars or time spent, staff, uh, you know, labor costs, things like that. The second objective was to generate and collect tax revenue. All these parcels that qualify for this process had to be delinquent for at least 10 years. Uh, so no taxes had been collected on any of these parcels for 10 years. And the last objective was to return the parcels to the active tax rolls to where they are generating property tax revenue on an annual basis. Just a brief review of what this process looks like. It starts with the board giving approval for the tax deed foreclosures. Then our office takes many steps following statute, begins with ordering title reports, sending legal notices to everyone that has a legal interest in these properties, culminates with the issuance of a treasurer's deed that conveys ownership from private party to the state of Arizona. Once that occurs, the board can then set a sale date to auction off these parcels. We just had a sale in March where we sold over 5,000 parcels. And then once that sale takes place, any amounts that are still owing, so amounts owing above and beyond the sales price, are then abated. Here we have a summary over the past Three years, we've had uh, four different groups of parcels that we've taken through the foreclosure process. Roughly 8,500 parcels that treasurer's deeds were issued for. And during the course of those four years, we've had almost 900 parcels which were redeemed by the current owner. And that is basically, they received the notice saying we were going to foreclose on the property. They don't want to lose the property, so they pay every single cent that is owing back taxes, penalties, interest, fees, all of that gets paid, brings the property to a current status in our tax rules. It's worth noting that in 2019, we had over 600 parcels which were redeemed, and approximately 28% of those were owned by one party. So it definitely made a difference that we have these owners that own large numbers of, of uh, parcels within our county. And he chose to redeem those parcels. 
So it was a, a big win for our office and the county. As far as expenses, we've had over the past four years roughly $107,000 in expenses. You can see the breakdown on the slide. These expenses only include hard costs that were in the budget were coded to this project. So those are monies that are actually being paid out to third parties outside of the county. It does not include any costs that would have been uh, transferred from our department to the recorder's office for the recording fees related to the treasurer's deeds. Again, going back to the redemptions, you can see over the, over the course of these uh, years, we've had about $1.6 million in redemptions that were collected. So again, that is a, a big revenue stream for the county, and this represents property taxes that had been delinquent in some cases for over 50 years. Next, we move on to administrative savings, and this is based on an average cost per parcel per year of $2.77. This is the cost of printing and mailing tax statements and delinquent notices. It does not include any staff time or labor costs. If you include the employee time and pay, the cost per parcel per year approaches $5. We have had two tax deed sales, one in 2019 and one this year. And I would, I would want to start out by just saying that the, the biggest difference between those two years' sales, other than the number of parcels that we offered, was the choice of vendor to host the public auction. And I'd like to give a big thanks to the clerk of the board. She's the one that, that really pushed for moving from real auction, who we used in 2019, to using public surplus this year. It made a huge difference. Public surplus casts a much wider net in terms of the bidders that were attracted to the sale. We sold a much higher percentage of the parcels that were offered. We sold almost two thirds of the parcels that were offered for sale. And you can see it generated a significant amount of revenue. I'll cover that here in a minute. But we offered over 7,500 parcels for sale this year and sold over 5,100. So that was a, a big boon to the county. It was over $3.5 million in delinquent property tax revenue that was collected. Here's just a slide showing the breakdown of the revenue that was collected. I wanted to highlight that there was a return of equity of almost half a million dollars. And this occurs per statute when a parcel is sold for more than the amount that is owing on it. So that difference between what the parcel is sold for and what was owing is then issued as a refund check to the previous property owner. So we sent out checks totaling $472,000 to the previous owners of these parcels. So in summary, over the past several fiscal years, we've had about $4.8 million generated through this process. And that's a combination of the revenue collected as well as the administrative savings over that time period. We've had over 8,500 parcels deeded to the state of Arizona, over 5,300 parcels sold at auction, and then as far as the abatements goes, it's approaching $14 million in abatements, and that will include the abatements that will be coming before the board uh, either at the next meeting or the first meeting in July for the 5,100 parcels sold this March. And we currently have over 3,100 parcels that have been foreclosed on, which either did not sell at the auction in March or which have not been presented for sale yet. So those will be available for the next auction. And that's all I have for you today. I'd be happy to answer any questions that the board may have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next is the consent items five through 60. Supervisor Lingenfeld, do you have any pull? Nothing today, Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Gould? None today, Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Bishop? None today. Supervisor Angus? Item 56. 
I'll take 12. I have a need a motion for items 5 through 60 minus 12 and 56. So moved. Second. Motion is second. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Item number 12. Uh, Mr. Murphy, you want to come on down? I don't know if you received a copy of the letter that came to us this morning from uh, American Tower, from their attorney. I, I did not. Okay. They said that they have room. Would it be okay if we continued this where you checked with them to see so we don't put too many towers up up there if it's possible? To uh, well, you, I own all of the land up there. They, I leased the land to them 20 years ago, mm. and I've leased tower space from them for that full 20 years. Uh, it's time for us to move on to our, uh, another parcel of our own property and build a tower that we can uh, control and build to our specifications. We've been on a tower that uh, up there have been actually substandard for a long time. We could now, with a new tower, optimize the tower, giving us additional coverage. And uh, we're part of the EAS system, the Emergency Action System. Uh, we also uh, provide, uh, uh, have provided space for, well, the county, uh, as a matter of fact, over these years. And so we're, uh, we're ready to build our own tower. It, it will not exceed the height of any of the other towers up there. Uh, it'll just be a more substantial system with a uh, solar, a primary solar system with a, with a uh, propane uh, generator backup. Okay, does anybody else have any questions? I have a motion. Motion to approve item 12. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second for the discussion. <clears throat> Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, motion carries. Item number 56, Supervisor Angus. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, Chairman Johnson, may I ask Michael Smith to come since this is a community service item? <clears throat> Hi, Michael. Hello, Supervisor Angus. So, uh, just so the audience knows, this item is about the county um, is, set, is set to receive yet another huge pot of money for the Emergency Rental Assistance Program, that amount being over $5 million. So, just as a little history, so back, uh, this is ERAP 2. So ERAP 1 was given to us early in the year, right? And we got it uh, given to us, it was deposited in the beginning of March, okay? And this money, as I understand it, was for uh, emergency rental assistance that would be uh, for the homeowner or the tenant, it would go to the, it would go to the homeowner um, or the business owner, it was for businesses and residential, correct? It was actually for just uh, residential. It was just residential. I, that, okay, I'm yes. sorry about that. And utilities. Yes. So in that time from March, we have advertised it. We, we speak about it almost every other meeting. Um, and as of at least last week, how much of that initial $5 million have we spent? Sure, great question. Uh, so as of last week on Friday, we closed. We were just over 800000 uh, dollars spent uh, and that's really when you think about it we just really started getting our team up getting things rolling uh, and moving things forward uh, I will just add uh, with that being said there's still a, a, another you know 200 plus applications that still need to be approved so when you think about that I mean really the, mo the money for the quarter could be almost close to 1.6 million uh, you know so you're looking at a quarter of what okay. was, was spent so we're, we're moving in the right direction, and, and I would just also note in regards to um, th the, the need in the community currently, uh, Mojave County uh, for like-sized counties is actually leading in, in total applications. Um, okay. 549 applications. Okay, so about 800,000, and you know, you said maybe if these other applications go through about 1.6. So that's still, as of last week, about 12% 
10 to 12, maybe 10, 15% of the original $5 million because people got to understand this has to be related to COVID. This was hardships due, not being able to pay your rent, not your utilities, from hardships due to COVID. So we've talked about this. I believe that if this had been presented last year when people were really hurting, um, that we would have done better. So here we are. I know Bullhead City has promoted the heck out of it. Um, and this is what has come back because I don't know if you believe like I do or the supervisors believe like I do. I believe COVID's in the rear view mirror. And I also believe people are resilient and that they have figured it out for their own lives that if they lost their jobs, lost their homes, they figured it out. They got new ones. They've gotten, they've moved to other places where there are jobs. They figured it out. So we have this pot of money sitting there. And um, now they're introducing another set, another batch of money. We can't give away the original one. And now they want more money. So, you know, I think the government thinks that people are like little birds in their nests and they're fragile and frail and they're waiting for government to come and put a little worm in their mouth. But people aren't like that, especially in Mojave County. So when I think about this, because let me just ask you a question. The requirements on this second pot of money, are they gonna be the same or are they gonna be looser? They're gonna be very similar, Supervisor Angus. They're gonna be similar. But didn't you tell me that you, you thought they were going to be a little bit looser? So the, the difference is, and I'll just give you a highlight, of one of the things that they were looking at in regards to ERAP2 is there's been about seven to eight different um, landlords in the county that have refused to participate in the program. Uh, so there's been seven to eight uh, actual residents that have not been able to receive funding for their emergency rental assistance. With that being said, the, the new application process would make sure that they still go through the vetting process so they would be vetted. But one of the things in regards to that is they would actually then be able to receive rental assistance as opposed to not under the first uh, ERPA one. Well, maybe people don't want to give all their information to the government, right? The, the natural place for this is, is in the nonprofit world. We have fantastic nonprofits in this county who help people in their times of need, and people know they care and they go there. So at some point, this looks less like COVID relief and more like ushering in socialism, where people go to the government when they need help on their rent and their utilities, and soon it's going to be food. and. I, for one, am not going to be a part of that at all. I don't think it's necessary. I wish the, if I wish the government, maybe you can talk and to, to whomever you talk to and ask that this money go to nonprofits who do a much better job. You know, the, the county takes a percentage of it, right? What's your, how much did we take from the last one? And again, that's a little game that we play here in government. But... Um, I, I am not going to support this, and with that, I'm going to make a motion that we refuse the money. All right, before, before we get into a second, I had a person signed up, okay. Supervisor Angus. Uh, Chris Rodarte. Good morning again. I'm Chris Rodarte, Kingman, and I am opposed to the current question. I'll be brief. Thomas Jefferson said, we in America do not have government by the majority. We have government by the majority who participate. All tyranny needs to gain a foothold is for people of good conscience to remain silent. As most of you know, I am seldom inclined to remain silent. In fact, I've been known to loudly voice my opinion on issues I believe threaten our freedom, liberty, and the very existence of our republic. And one such issue involves Agenda Item 56 on today's schedule regarding additional federal money to the tune of $5 million making its way to the county coffers. These funds allocated by the U.S. Treasury to the recipient Mojave County come with strings. Specifically, according to the proposed award, Mojave County must comply with all applicable federal statutes, regulations, and, wait for it, 
executive orders and, quote, recipient, Mojave County, shall provide for such compliance in any agreements it enters into with other parties relating to this award, unquote. In other words, any and all parties to the award agreement must also comply with all federal executive orders. In the last 100 or so days, we've seen the extent to which our newly installed president dashes out executive orders, harmful to the citizenry and counter to our Constitution. So I'm here before you today when you are deciding whether or not to accept the $5 million quid pro quo you will respectfully decline, vote no, and take the higher ground in favor of we the people. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second for discussion. Uh, Mr. Smith, I have a question. Um, how do you see this loan? Do you, do you see it as a positive or a negative? Or? Chairman Johnson, so I would just state that we brought this to the board for ratification because it, it did take a little bit of time to get it from May 5th to when they asked us to approve it or for the board to approve it. With that being said, we can always return these funds um, if we don't use the funds. Uh, that would be the biggest thing that I would note. One of the things that I would also note uh, when we think of where our communities are at, uh, if we look at the communities, it's pretty equal across the board. Bullhead is currently leading uh, with about $275,000. The rest of the counties have a suit. Um, and then uh, Kingman, right around $200,000, a little over that, $100,000 making up the rest of the county. So there is a need there. With that being said, one of the things that I did work with the state when I went back to see what, what was the need and moving forward, um, one third of the people that applied for this current assistance and aid uh, actually still needed to receive it for a second set because they have not returned to work. So when you start thinking of applications, and I think too, and we're just looking at it in general, um, I do believe our numbers with COVID are trending the right way. Um, but once again, uh, that nothing is uh, for sure indefinite. Uh, and with that being said, the money could be returned if we didn't use it. The money would go till 2025 if we, if we don't accept it. There will be no funding for the communities to move forward if, if something was to happen um, and COVID did come back at a, at a greater uh, ferocity. Would this money offset the other monies that we give out? Would it save us from giving out the other monies that we have? Is it kind of the similar? Uh, so it would be a, a dual fund. So they would be operating in the, in the same time frame once it's up and running. Uh, you'll expend the money from the ERAP1 first and then expend the ERAP2 money second. Any other questions? Supervisor Lingfelder. Thank you, Chairman Johnson. Uh, to Supervisor Angus's point, um, why doesn't, or is there a, a method or some sort of a vehicle for the county to act as a pass-through to our nonprofits? Um, I feel very strongly about, you know, our, all of last year, basically, and still this year, private businesses and nonprofits have been forced to compete with the federal government. And what has that done? That's created hardships for the owners, the private businesses, and it's created dependency in others. And I don't agree with that at all. Um, I don't think private businesses should be competing with the federal government. I don't think that nonprofits should be competing with the federal government. Is there a way for the county to act as a pass-through to the nonprofits? That's their role. So to answer your question uh, with the nonprofits, that would be difficult, and it would be difficult for a lot of the nonprofits to actually take on that role. And part of it would be if we, if we did something of that nature, uh, the county at the end of the day, it's my understanding, would still be responsible for the audit and the money that was actually allocated. So if the, if the actual um, non-for-profit misallocated the funds and didn't do it correctly, the county would be uh, held account for those funds. It's something that we could look into. I know with the way the program's currently been set up through DES, uh, there's an online access through the website. Uh, just to give you an idea of how that worked, like just even over the weekend, right? We, we added another 11 applicants from, from Friday's close of day till Monday. So they were able to do that via online people, learning of our information and, and seeing that information and being able to do that. Uh, to your point, I, I would agree that, you know, having not-for-profits and working with the not-for-profits like we do with the COC really does make sense and we do really change people's lives and it's the board's decision and, and I respect that of that direction. Well, I understand that there's some, some legitimate need out there. I, I get that, um, I'm not disputing that, but I, I think that it's just another way uh, that we grow government because we receive these funds and now all of a sudden you need a bunch of people to administer the funds and to, 
I don't know. I'm, I'm opposed to that. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Chairman Jones. Supervisor Angus. When, when is the deadline for the first ERAP money? Also. Sure. So the, the first one is 9 30, 2022. 2022. So in another over a year. Okay. And how about this one? The ERPTA2 will go until 2025. 2025. So we have COVID in the rearview mirror now. Unless the government is planning on unleashing another virus on us, um, the odds of this, you know, really being used are minimal. But it probably could be changed to people who need help. And again, just like um, Supervisor Lingenfelter said, there are people who fall between the cracks who need help in our community and that is why i'm adamant that it stays within the nonprofit, because not only is it the right place and they care but people don't really trust government especially in our county and they are less likely to go again open up their finances everything to the government where they feel comfortable with the nonprofits who've been existent in their communities for decades so I just, I just wanted to clarify that. Supervisor Gould. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Michael, you mentioned that uh, they had not yet returned to work when you were speaking a little earlier. I'm curious why they have not yet returned to work. So, so I wasn't necessarily saying they haven't returned to work. I said one third of the people have actually still applied for COVID uh, assistance. So they may have applied uh, to return to work, but they weren't making the same funds or receiving the same amount of income uh, so they could still qualify uh, for that or they just haven't uh, returned to work. They, they, those are questions that we don't have the answers to. It's just if you go by the guidelines of where the guidelines were, would be, currently you're still um, either on UI, correct, unemployment insurance, or you have not been able to find a job to pay you at the same amount that you might have been making prior to. So if you were making 30,000 pre-COVID and now you're making 15,000, you would still qualify for the program. We would find it hard to believe that they can't find a job at the wages that they were making before when um, hamburger flippers are pulling down 15 bucks an hour if they can be found. Um, and not to degrade hamburger flippers, there's a big problem in getting people to go back to work. We've now created um, basic universal income where people can sit around on their tails, not work. Um, it's destroying small business. It's destroying the nation. It's destroying the work ethic in the nation. And you're socializing America. Um, part of this is just the blue state bailout. Also, the federal government wants to bail out poorly run Democrat states by giving them money. And they have to give Republican states that money also because they can't just pick and choose which state they go to. Um, and, and this is problematic now. We, um, I mentioned uh, Supervisor Johnson said my computer wouldn't fire up because I hadn't signed the loyalty oath. Um, and then I questioned, do we even have to sign that loyalty oath now that we're re run by communists apparently? Um, but these continued government programs are just continuing to erode um, people's work ethic. And, you know, I'm not picking on you. I know that's, it, it's not you that's eroding it. You just happen to be the guy standing at the podium before me. Um, but we really need to get back to um, individual responsibility. The, uh, and bear in mind, when we talk about nonprofits, um, when we privatize welfare, that's really not much better than the government handling the welfare program anyway. There's a difference between private charity and, and privatized welfare. Private charity is where I decide, somebody makes a plea to me, I decide that's a worthy plea, I'm going to write you a check. That's, that's how we operated in America up until recently. Now we hire not-for-profits who have directors that pull down 100000 bucks to dole out government welfare also. So let's draw a line between privatized welfare and private charity also. But thank you. Are there any other questions? Mr. Chairman. County Manager. If I may, thank you, Mr. Chairman and board members, and respecting the perspective of the board members and what they have shared with us, I just would like to uh, point out a couple of things. One. Uh, 
one is these dollars um, uh, e a uh, e irap one were funds allocated by Congress to county residents um, for the needs related to COVID. We, the county, uh, opted to pool with the state Department of Economic Security, so we facilitated the expenditures. We, our role really is limited to just receiving and, um, and um, advertising uh, and uh, having uh, providing access to those residents that needed to come in and, and to apply and uh, be approved uh, so they can be helped. There are criteria in place that applicants have to meet in order to receive this help. And finally, if, if they do not meet those guidelines, um, and the funds not expanded in their entirety, uh, they will be returned where they came from. Uh, so we, we have uh, asked for some dollars, very minimal, in the order of a couple percentage to just provide public outreach, to get out in the communities and help those that need it. We really have no um, stake in this other than $800,000, as you heard, has been expanded. Those are individuals that met the need. And, um, you know, how many more, how many more dollars will be expended will be predicated on how many applications and how many qualify. If not all those funds are expended, then again, they will be returned. As far as the uh, ERAP 2, it would be really the same principles. I, I understand fully what the board members are saying. Um, COVID looks like is more and more is behind us in the rear view mirror, but the, guide, the um, qualification criteria is what it is. Department of Economic Security is administering the, the vetting, not us. So if there is anybody in the community that needs help, having those dollars available uh, would be the only way to deliver it. If the board does, re does turn it down, then those dollars would not v be available for any of those needs, and we don't know what the future holds. That's really the only thing I wanted to add. We understand and respect the board wishes, but I wanted to clarify those couple points, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Supervisor Lingerfeld. Thank you, Chairman Johnson. Manager Elters, uh, in the initial... Uh, pot of money, what remains? So um, we did, um, we received uh, f over $5 million. Uh, we asked for uh, 100 grand, give or take, for, administra for administrative purposes. We hired two individuals to help people fill out the applications. And we've, we've uh, disseminated, 800,000 has been disseminated uh, for approved applications. So I would say we are definitely, uh, we still have over $4 million. And Michael, that if you correct. can provide a specific number, that would be correct. That is correct. And when do those need to be expended by or used by? What, so we have date? until 9-30-2022. So there's still, there's still assistance available? Correct. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right, we have a motion and a second in front of us. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Item number 57. Accept monetary donation amount of $2,351 non-monetary donations, approximately $5,965 for the Mojave County Animal Shelter. Uh, Chairman Johnson, I believe this is on the consent agenda and was already approved. Oh, okay. Never mind. Thank you. <clears throat> sure. You got that one right. 61, then. Open the public hearing. Anyone wishing to address the board on item number 61? Very none. I'll close the public hearing. Have any discussion or a motion on item number 61 in a rezone? Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Gould. I move that item 61 be adopted. Second. 
We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Regular agenda, item number 62, discussion possible action. Adoption of Mojave County Ordinance 2021-03, the Building Code Ordinance. Replacing Mojave County Ordinance number 2020-04, adopting the 2018 editions of the International Code Council Codes and the 2017 National Electric Code along with the local amendments. We have people that wish to address the board. Tyler Ang Angle. Hello, my name is Tyler Engel. I'm the president of Angle Homes uh, that we build a residential home subdivision here in the Kingman area, both in the city of Kingman and out in the, the county jurisdictions. We work with the county building department quite a bit. I'm speaking in support of the 2018 adoption. <coughs> um, we've already had some meetings with the county and the review board to um, adjust the code or, or make it so that it would be a little bit builder friendly for our area. So they've made some some great adjustments there um, and removed some things that are real restrictive or would be really expensive to to adopt. And so the the code as it stands really doesn't have that many major um, significant or material changes and um, feel like it it helps us kind of keep up with the times there's some people around the country that are already adopting the 2020 um building building codes another item for us uh, personally we have about 240 houses under construction in the area right now and the city of kingman has adopted the 2018 code and it would would be a little difficult for us to juggle you know with each jurisdiction being on different codes and so uh, we are supportive supportive of the county also going to 2018 so that the area kind of stays under the same uh, uh, building rules um, as as far as that goes and our plans don't have to be real different between the the city and the county that way so there's a, a selfish component of that but but the county officials and building department's been really good uh, with working through what parts of the code would be real difficult to 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 build and accepting the ones that that would be helpful to keep us keep us up with the times. Thank you, sir. Maria Zini. Can, can I ask a question? Oh, sure. Sir, so you said that there are some things that make it better for you as a builder. Can you name me one? One is the portal wall design that's the the structural engineered design in the building code that would go for instance around a garage door opening or a very large uh, glass window opening there's an engineered thing in the code that kind of carries forward each year but it changed from the 2012 to the 18 <clears throat> and so now uh, several components of that are less restrictive whatever the national engineers have decided the straps can be downsized. They don't have to be 4,500 pound straps. They can be 3,200 pound straps, I think. So, so those are smaller and cheaper. And then the plates, you only have to go to two plates now under that instead of three plates. Um, so that's, that's one example. Do you know any, any of them that would be more restrictive? Um, or more expensive to the end user? One, like I said, most of them we kind of pushed back on and, and got um, removed or exemptioned or, or were changed to a, a may instead of a shall, so we, we're not forced to do. One of them is at the, the top plates inside the house where there's a plumbing penetration through the top of the wall or an electrical penetration. There's a, a guard plate that you hammer on the outside so that someone... Um, nailing something into the wall later doesn't have a nail that goes through and, and hits that that thing so now that plate has to be bigger instead of it being one inch it has to be I think three inches now so there's more protection there um, so the plates are a little more expensive and and uh, some of the guys complained about it but it wasn't wasn't that big of a deal so there's good and there's bad yeah is basically what I'm asking okay thank you yeah. thank you 
Maria Zemi. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman Johnson, uh, Board of Supervisors. Uh, my name is Media Zarmi. My address is 1896 Clear Lake Drive, uh, Fort Mojave in District 5. Uh, I'm the chairman of the Code Advisory Board. Uh, I'm going to, we know that we already discussed in the last meeting we had before you, so I'm going to just summarize the discussion, uh, you know, for today's meeting. Mojave County is the only jurisdiction in the tri-state area that has the Code Advisory Board. Uh, and these are consist of uh, uh, experienced professionals uh, in the field of engineering, uh, construction, and also uh, insurance industry, and also general public. Uh, code Advisory task is to review uh, any time that there is a build, the building official under the uh, instruction of the Board of Supervisors uh, is asked to review uh, a new code, uh, they would be able to address that and they would assign it to the Code Advisory Board. And uh, we would be able to dissect this code uh, in terms of like, you know, finding items uh, that are not compatible to our area or unnecessary cost factors uh, that is not applicable to our area without jeopardizing the safety of the building. Uh, and this is basically done through uh, notices that are being sent to all the general contractors and contractors in Mojave County. Uh, Mojave County Building Department uh, holds uh, uh, meetings in every city, Havasu, Bullhead, and Kingman. Uh, it's open for discussion. Uh, there are a lot of healthy debate going on back and forth. And uh, basically, uh, you know, the outcome is a modified a uh, softer uh, code that is applicable to our area. Uh, this has been done for 2012 and now for 2018 uh, is being uh, taken care of in that way. Uh, when uh, each of the members, when the process that we had on the Code Advisory Board is uh, each of the members were assigned a self-study program, meaning they'll take the material home, study it, uh, highlight it, come up with their, uh, things that they think it is not uh, compatible to the area or there's a cost factor. And then, uh, you know, there was be a debate, uh, you know, healthy debate with the other side, which is the building official. And uh, what you see before you is the amendments that was uh, done based on uh, those uh, input that you see there. Uh, in terms of the cost, I know that you know there was some discussion about that. Uh, it is studied already. All the cost factors, like energy code or Title 24, and all that is. May I continue? You finish your statement, Mr. Son. I'm sorry. You can finish your statement. Yeah. So uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, the cost factor I was uh, calculated, uh, and the base, uh, it is basically. Uh, all the cost factors, major cost factors, are extracted from it, like energy code, like, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Title 24. And, uh, you know, the estimated cost is a, a saving of $600 to about $100 charge. This is the, uh, you know, estimated uh, value you have. There, there were some discussions, uh, briefly I'm going to touch base on that, on the last meeting about Appendix G, which was regarding to the floodplain. Uh, the, uh, you know, back in uh, discussion we had in the code, they said that, you know, that's not applicable because Mojave County has a flood department, so that is not necessary, but it is already deleted from your uh, package. Uh, the other item was uh, about, you know, the, uh, that Supervisor Ron Gold brought it up about the misdemeanor and the felony case if someone decides to conduct a part of a job without any permit, Again, uh, back in 2015, we were working on the 2012 code. At that time, and then uh, uh, County Attorney Bob Taylor mentioned to us that that's a state law, and we have no jurisdiction over the state, uh, you know, thing. But uh, you know, Super, uh, Director Walsh uh, explained to us that you know uh, his department is not going to enforce that, and never done it, and they're not going to do that. Uh, 
the other thing that was brought up was like, you know, the why can't we stay with 2006 code? My personal opinion is that we review these codes every six years. Well, the next opportunity would be 2027. By then, we are working on an IBC that would be about 21 years old. Uh, I don't believe we want to advertise, uh, advertise that, uh, you know, when we have the 2018 before you that has a body of the 2018 and content of 2006 and 2012. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? I have a question. Uh, yes. Mr. Arzami, in our last meeting, there was a uh, photograph provided to the board um, showing a, a volume of the uh, UBS 97 code. And since that time, I've learned that there's actually three volumes of that, plus, plus other plumbing codes and mechanical codes. Can, can you explain that to us, please? I think you're referring to the picture that uh, Supervisor Angus received from uh, one of the contractors. Uh, it showed uh, uh, one, one book uh, uh, on code 2000, uh, 1997. Uh, code 90, 1997 comes with three volumes. Uh, only one volume showed in the picture, but I mean, overall, uh, if you add all those, uh, you know, three volumes, you're looking at about over 1,200 pages. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. John Campanetto. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you, sir. All right. <laughs> Good morning, uh, Chairman Johnson and um, Supervisors. Uh, John Campanetto, Fort Mojave, Arizona. I'm here today representing the Mojave Valley Contractors Association, of which I am the secretary. Uh, lately, um, for some time, uh, the 2018 codes uh, are trying to be adopted, and a, there appears to be a big push that we, if we don't adopt the 2018 codes, that our insurance rates are going to go through the roof. And I would like to demonstrate why that may not be the case. I do have a demonstration here. Okay, this is, a, this is a chart that's right out of the coordinator's uh, manual, uh, 2017, page uh, 110-3. And it shows um, what class the county's in in regards um, to the uh, uh, flood ordinances and such. And you see that we are currently a class six, which means uh, we have somewhere between 2,000 and uh, uh, 2,500, 2,499 points. Uh, and based upon that, um, insurance rates through FEMA can be deducted as much as 20% within the special flood area and 10% uh, outside the area. Now, according to um, the county information, uh, currently um, the points system, um, there's only a value of 100 points with adoption of the code. That's the most you can get is 100 points of that 2,000 to 2,500. And according to the value that the county currently now has, uh, they are attributing 68 points because adoption of the codes. Okay, now the current point value of the system right now is, is 2,084. So even if we didn't adopt another code, and even if we lost all 68 points, that would bring us down to 2016, which is still a class six. So to say that the interest rates are gonna go up because we're gonna lose discounts, it does not appear to be the case. Now, if there are some other deficiencies within the, the county plan that causes them to reduce or lose other points and gets them below 2,000, in that particular case, we may drop down to a class seven. 
and under that situation, we may go ahead and lose a 5% discount. Go ahead and finish your statement. 5% discount with uh, special flood areas, or maybe a 5% outside the flood uh, zone areas. But certainly it's not gonna drop us to a class nine, which has been presented in some, some information. That is not gonna happen. And you gotta keep in mind that um, the discount only applies to properties that qualify. Some do, some don't. I'd also like to bring up the fact that there are basically two types of insurance agencies. One's a captive insurance agency, the other's an independent insurance agency. A captive uh, insurance agency is, is, has to write flood policies that are FEMA endorsed. They cannot write any private policies. But a lot of times the captive agency knows this and they'll go ahead and refer the particular flood policy to an independent agency and the independent agency can then go ahead and write a private policy. And in speaking with um, independent agencies, 80% of their flood policies are written privately and 20% are written through FEMA. So even if we happen to drop to a class seven, I mean, we're not talking about this applies to everybody, it's not across the board. It's gonna be either none, none or a very, very small amount minimal impact at best if we don't adopt the codes on an insurance basis. I'd also like to say that, that the currently the, uh, the insurance uh, rate premiums are typically between $1,200 and $1,700. Uh, that's the value I've been able to come up with. Uh, one other issue is that um, if we don't adopt the codes, um, we're not gonna be able to get any more federal grants related to uh, flood, uh, flood items. And I'd like to say that since 2015, when we did not adopt the 2015 code, from 2015 to present, we've already received $4 million in grant funding, and we've already applied for another $1.4 million, and that's without adopting the most current card in 2015. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Larry Adams. Mr. Chairman, Supervisors, <coughs> Larry Adams, 2007, Highway 95, Bullhead City. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address you. First of all, I wanna say that uh, Bullhead City is under the 2006 building code and the county under uh, 2012. I am a contractor in Bullhead. I've worked under both codes for a number of years without any significant pro problems. Uh, you can work under two codes without a problem. The question comes up, if you adopt the 2018, uh, how much more is it going to cost? And nobody can really answer that question because nobody knows what's going to be enforced, what the interpretation is, and what's in the new 2018 code. It's thousands of pages. Even people who make a good effort to analyze what's in there can effectively do that in a short period of time. You'll only know after the fact what the cost is. There's been one study that they keep telling that was done supposedly on the affordability of this. Nobody knows what uh, criteria was used in that study. There was one done nationwide, to the best of my knowledge, that's all, and certainly none done locally. Nobody's demonstrated a need in Mojave County uh, benefit to the public that we need to do things differently than we're doing now. If there is a demonstrated need that arises, which there hasn't, you can certainly adopt the building code that we're under, or uh, uh, amend the building code we're under. You don't need to have a new code to address those issues. And there's absolutely not been one instance demonstrated that what's being done under the uh, current codes is not adequate to protect the public. Um, we have responded to most of this in writing. Uh, the supervisors have received that, so I'm really kind of repeating what points we've already made. We certainly do uh, support the adoption of the tiny house code and we maintain that you can do that if you have the 2006 building code 
adopt the amendment of the tiny house code, which we certainly support. That makes construction affordable in some instances, and that's what all of this is about. Uh, and then the point was made last time we met, if these things are safe in tiny houses, why aren't they safe in all houses? And I think that's a very good question. But we would urge you to ad uh, go back and adopt the 2006 building code. Uh, we're all familiar with that. We know what it costs. And amend that code by adopting the tiny house code. I thank you. Thank you, sir. Chairman Johnson, if I may have a question. Mr. Lingerfelter. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Adams, thank you for your testimony this morning. Um, just curious, can you tell me how many uh, active home projects you have going on right now? We had a Kingman contractor that testified he had over 260 homes under current development. Can you well, tell we, us how I you certainly have, have no nowhere near 240 houses. I am primarily a custom house builder, and we sell only, um, or the only, our projects are always sold to a specific client and tailored specifically to them. Uh, I would tell you that we're turning down 9 out of 10 requests at this time because we just can't do them. Just an order of magnitude estimate. How many would you say you do a year? Say again, please. Uh, just an order of magnitude rough estimate. How many uh, home projects do you think that you build a year right now? Well, depending on the year. Right now, I would pr project it will do somewhere between 40 and 50. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Angus. Um, so we've heard from Engel, and obviously they're uh, larger. Will this disproportionately hurt smaller contractors? Well, I don't think. Uh, I think it would influence contractors equally, whether they're small or large. I don't think uh, there'd be a difference in, in the effect on the size of the contractors. So also, somebody mentioned that now there's 2020 codes. So is this something that happens every couple of years? They, they go in and they tweak stuff? Yeah, they revise the code every three years. And I think it's important to note that the codes are written by private enterprise, not a government entity. And in order to maintain that organization, they have to get people to adopt the new code periodically so they can sell the code books which if you go to buy all of the code books that you're asked to adopt today will probably cost somewhere in the neighborhood of $2,500 to $3,000 just to buy the books. But if the code council can't uh, for, force or convince people to adopt a later code every three years, that organization's out of business. And they'll do anything, say anything, to maintain uh, their business. And it is a private business, make no mistake about it. So just to recap, the county is, functions under the 2012 building codes. And um, Bullet City is still at 2006, and there's no plans to change that. And everything's kind of working out fine. The gentleman earlier said that um, he believes this will be better, there are better things in it. Do you have any room for that? Well, I, as I stated when I started, uh, yes, Bullhead Cities under the 2006 absolutely has no intention because of cost and complexity of adopting any code above that at this time. Uh, but we've worked under uh, 2006 in this city and 2012 in the county for a number of years now uh, with no particular problem. Now, uh, in the county, We've had the 2006 throughout this period of time on residential building. We had the option of working under the 2006 or the 2012. So you can work with these things. You really can. Mm -hmm. And it was stated at the last meeting, they've amended the 2018 code to where it's about identical to the 2006. That recognizes the fact that the 2018 code is excessive and unnecessary. So it would appear to me the logical thing to do would be to adopt the 2006 building code again with a tiny house amendment. We do need the tiny house amendment. We're all struggling with affordability, not just here but nationwide. 
And it's a known fact that everybody in the world is struggling trying to find a way to provide affordable housing. Now, codes aren't the only reason that the cost of housing is going up by any means, but it's certainly a contributing factor that we can control. There's no need to make this more restrictive uh, by about continuing to upgrade the code without any demonstrated need. Thank, thank you. Chairman Johnson. Supervisor Bishop. Thank you. So, Mr. Adams, uh, Mr. Adams. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, uh, I'm curious that, that you believe that these code books are amended just, just so that this company can sell more code books. Uh, I just found that uh, interesting. But I wanted to ask you uh, a question about the Mojave Valley Contractors Association. How many general contractors are members of this association that you belong to? I don't have the specific number of can, uh, general contractors that belong right now. We have a total membership at this time of somewhere around 70. How many of those are general contractors? I'm sorry, I can't tell you. Okay, did, uh, do you know whether or not uh, the members participated in the building, um, in, in the meetings held by the building officials? In the uh, city area. They were represented by myself and John Campanetto, and yes, we participated in every meeting. Okay, so you also participated in the code advisory board that was scheduled to review this 2018 code? Yes, we did. Okay, uh, did you or John ha or any of the members of the Mojave Valley Contractors Association that reviewed the code book. Did you see any items over and above what the code advisory board is recommended to be taken out in the form of an amendment to the 2018 code? Okay, if I understand your question, do we have anything that needs to be taken out? Is that your question? Yeah, do you have anything specific in mind? If, if we adopt this new code, is there anything that's really uh, well, the one thing specifically that we um, identified in the code is appendix, I forget the appendix uh, G, was it? Um, appendix G. Appendix G, SB. that's the flood resistant construction, and I believe that that's been removed from the proposed ordinance. Yes, that's primarily, but have we gone through, you know, they, they talked about the current or the 19 or the 18 code being less restrictive on hold down straps and that is true but you're talking about going from maybe four dollars to three dollars on a specific strap they are not um, you know that's totally insignificant on the total cost but none of us have had time to pour through the thousands upon thousands of pages in all these codes uh, to make individual recommendations. We'll know what's in them when we know how they're enforced, and then we'll know what it costs, and not before. So you are aware that the, uh, the Building Advisory Board uh, gave assignments to each member to, to study specific sections so that, so that this entire code was studied in, in detail? I mean, well, you attended those meetings, right? So you're aware of that? Yeah. To the best of my knowledge, the Code Advisory Board did not look at it, all the individual sections of the building code. They were less thorough this time than when they proposed to adopt it in 2012. To the best of my knowledge, they didn't look specifically at the various sections of the code. And again, that's not very practical. You're talking about thousands upon thousands of pages in this code. And we're not only talking about the building code, we're talking about the uniform mechanical code, electrical code, plumbing code, life safety code, uh, all of those codes. And when you adopt this 2018, you adopt all of those additional codes. And no, I don't know what's in them, nor does anybody alive know what's in them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, thank you. Richard Hamilton. Good morning. My name is Richard Hamilton. 
I live at 2789 East Cali Castano here in Kingman, Arizona. I'm also a contractor and a board member for the Mojave County Advisory Code Board. This board is made up, was made up, or is made up by you, the county supervisors, for us to do our due diligence on matters such as this. This board is also made up of licensed contractors, licensed electrical engineers, licensed architect, professional engineers, and a member of the public. And I can assure you, and Mr. Adams, that we have done our due diligence on this matter. We've had several public meetings to address the issues to discuss the uh, prior supervisor's meeting. We've asked several times, bring us the cost increase. Go over the codes, the, the codes that are going to be changed or amended or struck, and bring us the cost analysis of what that's going to be, where it's going to increase. That has not been done. We have not seen it. We have done our due diligence on this. To quote the uh, National Association of Home Builders, the estimated cost of the 2018 IRC code changes shows modest cost impacts for most homes ranging from a minor $100 increase to a $600 savings over the 215 IRC. Homes in moderate or high seismic regions or coastal flood zones may see significant increases, cost increases. New, new opinions for insulating attics may provide significant changes. I can tell you that for me, when I price out metal buildings, on the 2018 code compared to the six or the 12, we are saving up to $2,000 for an average size metal building, mainly because of the seismic impact that, that we have to put in. We don't have to increase the seismic load on the buildings anymore. In the 2018 code, it's been dropped. There's only a few changes in the code book that are, that are being changed. And uh, that, that has been, that's what was presented to us on recommendations. Example, the International Residential Code has approximately 20 strikes. That was presented to us. A half a dozen word changes, approximately two dozen amendments. And, and the entire book on the IRC has not been changed. This is it right here. This book, as a builder, is one of my Bibles that costs me $88. That's a small price for me to stay in code and build things right for the consumer and save the consumer money. This book right here, Supervisor Johnson, thank you. This book right here is our book that we went through that had the building code changes, what was struck, so forth and so on. It had the fire code, the international building code, international residential code so forth and so on. Those were not significant changes in there. Again, most of them were strikes on amend or amended or strikes. Oh, bear with me here, I'm losing my place. Supervisor Gould, I have to, and this is kind of, I don't want to beat a dead horse after Medi, our chairman had said a few things. But after watching the video of the, of the last meeting when we talked about this, it was brought up that, there, that uh, you don't want to go to jail or send a private citizen to jail if we adopt the 2018 code book. That's simply not true. Arizona Revised Statute has a statute in there that if you don't follow certain rules and regulations, you're going to jail. It doesn't matter if it's the 06, the 15, the 18, or the 97. That revised statute is, if I understand correctly, would be 118. 1.5.C on that statute. The 2018 code book does not just add in there, and with this 2018 code book, don't think that we didn't vote on this to incriminate ourselves. Don't think that we didn't do this so we can go to jail. We want things to be better for the public and better for us and uniformed across the board. I'm a licensed contractor in the state of Arizona, the state of Nevada, and the state of Hawaii. Most of them go on the boards. If we go backwards to the 2006, then where am I going to be as a builder for the consumer? It's just simply not going to work. 
The purpose of these codes, these updated codes, are for this, the health and the safety and energy code efficiency for the public. The cha these changes in these rules are no different than if somebody changes a sports rule in football, baseball, whatever it is, cars, whatever it takes to make them safe, more efficient for the consumer. That's what this is for. That's what we're trying to do. We're not trying to go backwards by any means. Again, we have done our due diligence on this. I can't speak totally for the, my other board members. I know that they were very uh, talkative about this throughout our meetings, but I can tell you and I can promise you that I have done my due diligence to go over the codes for the IRC and the IBC of what we needed to adopt. And I encourage you to vote yes on this 2018. I also, I got to throw out, I forgot to do it. It was brought up, Supervisor Bishop, you had had a question about the code books, about them being different. And I do have the illustration of your code books. Of what we used to be in 97 compared to what we are right now. And every one of these books, let me throw my five fingers instead of my four. Every one of these books have been consolidated into this book right here. So I just wanted to point that out. Are there any questions? Thank you, sir. Chairman Thank Johnson, you. I have a... Oh, I Supervisor have a Bishop, question. one second. Uh, Richard, how many people do we have on the Building Code Advisory Board? Seven. Seven. And, and you said they're all general contractors, they're electrician, electrical engineers, and... You have one that's an electrician. He also uh, does dirt work. He's also a uh, city council member. You have architects, you have engineers, you have general contractors, and again, a member of the public. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Do we have any questions of Mr. Walsh? Want to hear from him again? Chairman Johnson. Supervisor Lingenfelder. Thank you, sir. Uh, I do have a question for Director Walsh. Really only one question, Tim. Uh, in my mind, it, it's all about how efficient and how cost effective this is going to be to our contractors. Um, do you have a list? Maybe that's not the right word of, of by adoption of the 18 codes, um, cost savings to our contractors. I haven't heard that yet. Chairman Johnson, Supervisor Lingenfelter, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, my chief building official, Gilbert Smaby, has actually gone through and, and uh, I asked him in anticipation to, to go ahead and, and, and identify some cost savings that, that were related in adopting the 2018 code. Um, if I can maybe go through a, a few of those. A few of them have been mentioned already. Um, one of them is, is uh, the portal frame. Uh, for those that aren't familiar, Portal Frame basically allows you to to install a a, a, a garage or a, a an area where you don't have enough uh, support in order to to prevent that wall from swaying one way or the other. So the the codes, I think it was about in 2006, 2009, came out with a, a Portal Frame design as a prescriptive method. Prior to that, an the, the contractor would have to hire an engineer to, to design that and, and keep it from swaying for him. Um, as the codes have gone along, they've improved that design. And, and with the 18 code, uh, they've improved that design. And, and as was mentioned, they've, they've limited or, or, or reduced the number of brackets uh, that are required per, uh, per, per the frame, as well as, as some of the plating. And uh, our, our numbers show that, that with each portal frame, it's required to have at least two brackets for each frame. Um, and if for, a, for each garage, you have, for each garage door opening, you have one portal frame. So, uh, you know, a two-car garage, three-car garage, you're looking at least two portal frames. Now, these portal frames can also be used in other places in the house, like a, you think a bay window or something like that, where your, your walls are doing all sorts of different shapes. Um, these portal frames are also utilized there. So... It, not a huge savings, but, but basically the, the savings that you're seeing right now with these brackets is about $7.50 per bracket. For uh, just the garage, you're, you're going to save yourself probably, you know, $30. For an overall house and, and the number, you could probably save around $100, $100, uh, 100 to 120 a house, depending on how many of these portal frames are utilized. 
Um, some of the, the, the larger ticket items um, is they, they've allowed for a prescriptive method um, for insulating attics. Um, prior, prior to uh, these codes, it, it was more of a, you'd have to do uh, an energy savings analysis to, to determine this, this uh, method of, of insulating the attic, but it's a spray foam uh, option which allows the, uh, the insulator to come in and rather than put in bat foaming, which is, is pretty common, they, they blow the foam in and it sits on the ceiling. Um, they actually sp spray the under deck of the roof and, and they found that, that this method to be quite, uh, quite a bit more efficient. And while it's, the application is a little bit more expensive than, than the, the bat foaming, the overall savings comes um, on the, uh, the air conditioner um, the, the HVAC system that they can actually downsize those HVAC systems based on that that improved efficiency, and we're seeing anywhere from five hundred to a thousand dollars per home on on that savings alone. Um, tiny homes were mentioned. Um, definitely, this is a, an option that allows for a, a, an affordable housing. Um, the tiny homes uh, basically allows for those smaller structures and in order to achieve that smaller structure they've relaxed some of those standards um, that you would find in your typical homes um, and, and really i know the question came up last time as far as okay if it's safe for a tiny home is it safe for a for a, a larger home it, and i would argue the the answer to that yes it would be safe for for both of those um, i think it comes back to a, a matter of standards um, a matter of what's expected um, by the person purchasing that house. If you're buying a, a tiny house, you're going to expect that those smaller condensed areas, where if you're buying a, a regular single family uh, home, you're going to expect that standard that you left in your last house to be at this one as well. But, but allowing for those tiny homes is definitely a, a huge cost savings. And, and really, I don't have a, a number to throw at that. Um, but, but definitely, you figure going from a, a 2,000 or a 1,500 square foot home down to a, a 400 square, square foot home, there's definitely a, a savings allowed there. Um, let's see, what one really, really uh, significant change that, that we've seen that the 18 code allows for, uh, we, it's, a, it's a new term out there, at least it's a new term to me, is uh, barn dominiums. And, and basically what a barn dominium is, is, is you'll have somebody build a, a, a metal building and you'll construct this metal building and then inside that metal building you're, you'll build your, your residential uh, structure. And one thing that we've seen, so you've got this, but then you've also got um, you know, the, these people coming from California or, or from wherever, they, people, people like their toys these days, and the garage is never big enough. So you're seeing a lot more uh, metal building garages. I think Mr. Hamilton alluded to the number of, of metal buildings that he's doing right now. Um, with the 2012 code, it limited the size of those metal buildings to 3,000 square foot. And once you got over that 3,000 square foot, you had to place in a firewall in there to, to start creating some separation. Um, and what they did was they were looking at it uh, more from a, a commercial standpoint, a metal building coming out of the IBC and, and more of a commercial application. Because of the demand, I think they've looked at it and said, hey, you know, more people are going to these and it's a residential use. They've, they've re removed that 3,000 square foot uh, requirement or that limit and, and now they can build these larger um, metal buildings to, to house their toys. And, and really, if you look at the cost of that, that firewall that, that they no longer have to construct, um, that's, that can be anywhere 5,000 to 10,000 uh, for one of these, these uh, metal buildings. Um, one, one big thing that, that's been mentioned as well is, is the wind loading in the 2018 code. Um, it drops, so the 2012 code has the wind loading set at 115 miles per hour. In the 2018 code, it drops to 96 miles per hour. Um, and, and as was mentioned by Mr. Hamilton, that's caused a, a savings in, in metal building prices um, for anywhere to two to $3,000 on, on those. Um, the 2018 code also uh, allows for the, uh, s some of the, the wall bracings. Um, 2012 required uh, more wall bracing through it. 2018 actually re reduces the amount of wood wall bracing in a wall line. Um, so basically you think 
you've got your exterior walls, you, you gotta have so much bracing in order to keep that wall standing straight up. Um, they've reduced the number of, of those wall bracings, so you know, that's number of plywood that you don't have to put on each wall bracing. Uh, so that can save you, you know, anywhere from 100 to $200 per wall. Um, and I think I've rattled off a whole lot here at you. <laughs> Um, I've got a couple more. So those are, are a lot of them that we're seeing with the residential code. And, and just to kind of point out, if I may, the residential code is, is really what our contractors, our home builders, that, that's what they go to. That's the one code that they go to. Um, generally, they don't, need, they don't have a lot of need to go outside of the, the international residential code, the IRC. Um, when we start getting into commercial, that's where the IBC, the IPC, you know, and the other codes that, that we're also proposing to be adopted come into play. But for your, your general contractors that, that deal mostly in residential, the, the IRC is, is the one that they'll focus on. But uh, when we look at the, uh, the IBC, um, there is a number of, of savings for, for uh, an office building of, of, of an occupant load of less than 25. In the 12 code, um, you're required to have two separate bathrooms, um, one male, one female bathrooms. The 2018 codes actually reduce that down to, to just one unisex facility. So it, you figure you can get rid of a bathroom, that's ten to $25,000 in savings for, a, for an office building with less than 25 people in it. Um, in, the older co or in the 12 code, uh, storage rooms, were considered a separate type of occupancy, a separate type of rating. Um, so they would require firewall or, or whatever type of separation from the, 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 uh, the occupancy load for the rest of the building. That's been changed with the 18 and they can actually be um, classified under the same occupancy. So that's a savings, again, anywhere from 500 to 2,500 depending on the size. Um, Mezzanines in the 2018 code uh, used to, or in the 2012 code, used to have one exit going directly to the outside. So if you think of like Meyer Industry, if they had a, a mezzanine upstairs, that mezzanine needed to have an exit to the outside. Um, the 2018 code no, no longer requires that. So there's a, a pretty significant savings on, on the, the exit and then the ladders down, or the stairs down and all of that. And then, uh, just a couple more. The, the 18 code has increased the exit travel distance and storage and, and factory type occupancies, um, providing for, for less egress doors. So, so you can go a little bit further um, away from the door before you have to start adding another exit to that door. Again, that's, you know, depending on, on that, that's a, a $500 to, to $2,500 savings. Um, one, one other item that uh, is, is new with the 18 code is one thing that, that we were seeing um, solar, solar uh, panels on, on residential structures. They, they, and I may have to get uh, Gilbert up here to help me explain a little bit better, but uh, the, uh, the wattage being brought in from the solar units was counted against your, your uh, total uh, capacity for your, for your uh, uh, panel. The 2018 code has, has come up with a new way of, of tying that in to where it no longer counts against you. So, so all, you can increase the, uh, the number of panels on your roof without having to decrease the, the capacity of your panel. So I, uh, I think I just <laughs> shared a whole lot of stuff. I'd be happy to answer any questions or ask Gilbert to help me with them as well. well I thank you for your comprehensive answer. And uh, would you say that the cost savings uh, outnumber the costs increases from what we've seen in the homework that we've done um, yes absolutely great you know the only thing I would say is I think that the women get the short end of the stick with those unisex bathrooms but uh, <laughs> thank you for your your information thank you supervisor Angus just for clarification Tim um, are you so right now in the 2012 codes there's nothing about tiny homes the, or is it just I, I don't i didn't get that so so the 2018 code introduces the appendix q i believe um which which 
in, basically provides for the uh, for the tiny homes. Okay, but there's nothing in 2012 that we're on right now. So if I wanted to build a tiny home, what would I have to do right now under 2012? So under 2012, in order to build a tiny home, uh, you would basically have to meet the, the requirements and the standards of a, of a single family residential home. So some of the some of the things that that were relaxed in order to get to a, a tiny home, you wouldn't be able to do because the the single family or the the regular structure would require those as standards. Um, some of the 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 changes or some of the things that they allow for is um, instead of putting in stairs, you can have a ladder um, to get up to a, a loft and, and different things like that. But yeah, there are, there are a number of things where the, the standards have been relaxed in order to to get that that uh, some is uh, minimum minimum room uh, square footage and that they've, they've reduced that in order to allow for it you know um, when you talked about the metal buildings and the firewall I had a constituent who had an issue with that and it just it, it never made sense to me um, and so I'm glad that at least that has been addressed and that is a big cost saver it, it will be definitely but again, before I make my vote, you're confident that the cost savings outweigh the cost um, hikes? From, as, as I mentioned, from, from the homework that we've done, as well as speaking with um, various contractors, yes, I'm confident that the, that the, the cost will, that there will not be an increased cost based on, on the codes, but, but definitely that there's an opportunity for savings there. Okay, and you're not going to come back in 20, in a couple of years and ask us to go for the 2020? I will not do that. Okay. Chairman Johnson. Supervisor Bishop. I'd like to make a motion. I move that we uh, adopt Mojave County Ordinance 2021-03, replacing uh, the former ordinance number 2020-04. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Discussion. A motion and a second uh, for the discussion, Supervisor Gould. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Walsh, come on back up here, please. So currently in Mojave County, do we have a minimum square footage for a home? I'm going to call on my chief building official. Chairman Johnson, Supervisor Gould. Um, currently, the 2012 code and 6 code had minimum square footage for room sizes. So it basically called out that you had to have a minimum room size of 120 square feet, and each additional bedroom would be 70 square feet in size minimum. Um, it also included that you'd have to have a private bathroom, and that bathroom would be measured by the fixture clearance requirements. So we, we basically got it down to a little under 300 square feet where you could actually do it if you had a Murphy bed that you ate breakfast on. So we, the size of a sleeping room is 70 square feet and the size of other rooms are 110 square feet, but we don't require a, there's no minimum size for the house other than the minimum sizes for the rooms and that it has to have a private bathroom. Supervisor Gold, correct, correct but the, the 2018 code did eliminate the one requirement for one room to be 120 square feet. So, so the, the only size. requirement with the 18 code? With the 18 code, it has a minimum uh, bedroom size of six and a half feet when reg regular residential code required seven feet. Okay. Um, so apparently when the 12 code adopted some things that were overbuilt, it sounds like. I wouldn't say overbuilt, but they're... Uh, well, I'll reiterate that the tiny home appendix, the, the biggest problem was trying to fit enough square footage in and still have sleeping rooms, eating rooms, and per se a, a living room area. Um, what most people went with was a loft. And the IRC, the residential code, 2012 and 6, didn't account for any loft and accounted for full staircase. And so in, in a lot of the tiny home situations, you couldn't provide a full staircase to compliance. So that's one of the, the, major, uh, the major things in the tiny home ordinance is a reduction of head height in the loft area and staircase to get up there. 
um, which, which would either be a ship ladder, a regular ladder, or we've seen some really steep stairs, which, again, the, the residential code doesn't allow that. It has a certain rise and run that you have to meet. Which is interesting because the code is supposed to protect life and safety and not aesthetics. Correct, but they've also reduced the size of the structure down to 400 square feet. Sure, and actually my overbuilt comment was in regard to the moment walls, the sheer walls on around windows and garage doors. Apparently those were overbuilt in the 12 code since the specs have been reduced in the, in the 18 code. What they did, they did a, uh, there's several ways to uh, account for wall bracing. Um, and there's five different methods that you could use. One, the most popular is typically wall bracing panels of OSB or plywood. What they did, uh, there was a, a prescriptive method that you could use in the code on a table that said basically you had to have a minimum four foot section every 20 feet along a wall line and also had to be within 10 foot of a corner. So basically that was the prescriptive method. If you followed that through one wall, break, one wall line, you were okay. Another method came in that said you could do a calculation and reduce those amount of panels based on the cum cumulative effect of the bracing in that entire wall line. So the, the 18 code actually looked at that and went a little bit further uh, to allow you to use a calculation to basically say you have the same amount of wall bracing in there, but we'll let you reduce it down panel wise based on the location and, and where they're located. So it gave a different, it gave several options. The six code didn't have this option at all. The, eight, the 12 code and the 18 code do provide additional options for the builder in order to meet wall bracing requirements. They were talking about the reduction in size of metal straps also? Um, in the portal frame, like we said, the garage doors typically under code for prescriptive, if they had four foot sections on each side of the garage door, you could have a single header across and straight to the king stud. Um, in the 2006, actually 2003 code, yeah, that was the standard. Then they went to a two-foot section with hold downs into the foundation. So the 2006 code came along and the American uh, Plywood Association created what they call the portal frame design. So they, they took in uh, a design and tested the thing and then basically presented it to the code council and the code council adopted it and put it verbatim in the code section. Now that was a 2006, but it only gave one, it gave one standard how to build this wall. So the 2009 code came along and actually redid all the wall bracing. Um, unfortunately, it was a really terrible code. They made it so confusing and really hard to read. The, 18, the 12 code came back in and looked at it and redid it and made it a lot easier. It gave more tables and stuff, and then it gave three different options for the portal frame design. It had one for continuously sheathed structures, it had one for panelized wall bracing structures, and it had one for garage portals only. And all three of those designs are different, and they have different hold down requirements. I'll just say like, like the 2012 code for continuously sheathed, that means you've, you've basically OSB'd or, or plywooded the entire structure, they basically came back and said, we don't, you don't need those hold downs in those wing walls on the garage because of the lateral resistance based on all the OSB of the whole plywood structure. So, so again, the, through, as the codes progress, they, they actually provide more options uh, to the builder in order to meet compliance. So it's, not a, it's a change in, uh, it's not the change in the physical forces to the building, it's just a change in how people are applying the the physics to the situation and some engineering as i said uh, you know say you're required to have a uh, 30 percent of the wall in wall bracing and then they've came back and said you know if you have a lateral wall or some other condition that strengthens that wall that calculation actually lets you reduce that amount of wall bracing so by by testing and engineering there's been options provided that actually can reduce materials methods you know what is interesting I think it was about 12 or 15 years ago they the code outlawed the use of lead in bracing it still is permitted in the code interesting must have been a local yeah have a um, thing the problem with that is you have to hit three stud bays and at no greater than a 60 degree so sure. you lose a lot of area for windows or doors sure thank you supervisor Langenfelder chairman Johnson yeah I just want to um, make a comment it's been interesting to watch Material prices lately, the cost of lumber, the cost of concrete. Um, so any cost savings that this board can pass on to our contractors during this time, I think it's a good thing. So thank you for your, all of your work. 
Roger Angus. I have one more question. Um, in these codes, is it once we once it gets passed, it is just set in stone? Is there any room if, if you know, there are some unintended consequences? Is there any way to come back and this board can tweak it on your recommendation? Supervisor Angus, yes, there is um, two ways that they can do it. They can uh, uh, basically write to me, and I can get the uh, code advisory board together to look at an amendment. To that, um, okay. the other is an appeals process that basically is the same thing. It's the, the building code advisory board would look at any recommended uh, uh, amendments, and then those okay. would be taken to the planning and zoning commission, and then later be brought to you. Is it law, they'll always be unintended, you know, consequences and actions and things that happen. But okay, thanks. Thank you. If there's no further discussion. We have a motion in front of us. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. All opposed? No. Motion carries. We'll take a 10 minute break.
I've got a request to bring up a or do we jump in the agenda to item number 69. This is placed on by me, discussion of possible action, directing all fees collected by the Mojave County Medical Examiner's Office to be turned over the general fund, starting with the new medical examiner contract that goes into effect July 1st, 2021. Uh, I placed this on the agenda because we have a lot of fees that the medical examiner, people don't know, is, is an outside contractor, so everything that's in the contract is, is what they do. And, and I think that we should be collecting all fees to come to the county, and then we can reimburse them, raise the person's salary up, or whatever we want. But, the, but we should have control over that. And, and I think, um, Supervisor Gould, do you have anything you want to address on this also? Uh, and, I, and I think we need to make sure that we have uh, a good contract as far as outside business that can be run out of the coroner's office, you know, by the people if they're taking second jobs and uh, that look like a conflict of interest. I just think we need to review our contract. Uh, that was why I placed it on before we hire somebody. Thank you, Chairman. That would just be made part of the new contract that uh, the county negotiates? Y yes, I believe so. I don't know if, is uh, Ms. Orr here where she wanted Good morning, Chairman Johnson, members of the board, and thank you for taking me out of order. I do have to travel up to Vegas this afternoon. Um, just as a bit of information, I don't know if you can see this or not. Since FY15-16, uh, the actual fees collected by the medical examiner um, are estimated approximately $100,000 annually, so that takes those contract numbers up by $100,000, those fees go in there. Currently, we do have an RFP out on the street, um, and Section 2 of that RFP does call for fees established by the board. Um, will be will be kept and maintained as part of the operation, so we'd have to issue an amendment on that RFP. But based on any directions that the board gives us today, of course, we'll move forward in that direction. Uh, Chairman Johnson, I'm sorry, this is quite loud. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't mean it to be that loud. May, may I add to that? Sure, Mr. I, I, have no, I have no objection to the, to the discussion that you've made so far. The only thing that I'll add to it is that any fee that we establish, which has already been done, and this is the practice that we do, any fee that you establish has to go back in for the services or products that are provided. So just if it does go to county general, then it has to go back to, to those services. It can't be directed to, for example, to roads or to something else that's not related to the service that is being provided. Correct, but we have an idea now that, say, 100000 a year was coming in, so if we wanted to increase the, the salary or the contract by 100000 or negotiate it somewhere, at least we would have the record of the money. I, I don't think anybody considered we were going to take that money. We just wanted I, I was asking that we would have an accounting of it that the public could see instead of just letting somebody take the money. Got it. I understand. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hoare. Do you need a motion to direct staff to look at our concerns in the next contract? Uh, yes, you can do that if you wish. All right. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gould. I move that item 69 be adopted. Second. 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 I have a motion and a second for discussion here. And then all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same side. Motion carries. All right, item number 63 sitting as the Board of Directors of Mojave County Flood Control District. I have no one signed up for this. Do I have a motion? Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Gould. I move that item 63 be adopted. Second. I have a motion and a second for the discussion. Seeing that, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Item number 64, approve the adoption board of supervised resolution 2021-078. I have no one signed up for this. Chairman Johnson, I make a motion to approve. Do we have a second? A second. A motion and a second for the discussion. Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign? No. Motion carries. 
Item number 65, uh, approve the resolution 2021-079 to rescind and replace resolution 2004-547. Um, have no one signed up for this item. Do have a motion or discussion? Mr. Chairman. Yes, Supervisor. I move that item 65 be adopted. Second. A motion and a second. Further discussion. Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 In opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Item number 66. Discussion possible action authorize the department to apply for Arizona Department of Emergency Military Affairs for $142,949. I have no one signed up for this. Does anybody have a motion? Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Gould. Cool. I move that item 66 be adopted. Second. Motion and second. No further discussion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same side. Motion carries. Item number 67. Supervisor Lingenfeld. Thank you, Chairman Johnson. This is a follow-up to our April item. Uh, we've now seen the U.S. Treasury provide their guidance, and I believe that... Uh, Manager Elters and his staff have a presentation for us, maybe this morning? Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, board members, good morning again. Just to provide a quick refresher uh, related to this item. The American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA, uh, as it is known, si was signed into law on March 11th, 2021, and is effective through December 31st, 2024. Expenses under the law are authorized for processing until December 31, 2026. Mojave County allocations are $41,213,672. Funds intended, were intended for delivery in, in two parts, half within the 60 days of the law and the remaining half one year later. Mojave County received $20,606,836, which was the first half, and that was received on May 21, 2021. As anticipated, the interim final rule, or guidelines also as known, were issued, and I, I really want to underline the interim final, um, <laughs> were issued by the U.S. Treasury uh, and questions, comments regarding the interim guidelines are sought out and solicited through the end of next month, July uh, 31, 2021. Then the final, final guidelines will be published, and it's, they're anticipated in August of this year. So the current guidance for Treasury, from Treasury, covers both eligible as well as and eligible uses, and I'd like to go over those with you. In some details, uh, there's a lot of information available. I tried to work with our staff to summarize it in such a way that we can cover it here. Um, as you will see, we will go through categories of eligible as well as categories of ineligible, and each, each category has sub categories as well. So um, the, the first category is uh, of eligible expenses is uh, supporting the public health response. And that gets into medical expenses, behavioral uh, health care, and public health uh, resources. And specific examples are contact tracing, isolation, or quarantine. PPE purchases, enforcement of public health order, um, capital investment in public facilities to meet pandemic operational needs, as well as ventilation improvements in key settings like healthcare facilities. Those are examples of, those, those are some examples, but not all. That's one subcategory. The other subcategory is services to address behavioral health care needs um, exacerbated by the pandemic, and that includes um, mental health uh, treatment, uh, substance misuse treatment, uh, crisis intervention, among others. And the last uh, sub 
category under the uh, first header was payroll and covered benefit expenses that would pertain to public health, healthcare, human services, public safety, among others. That, um, and, and I, I wanted to bring us back, that is the first uh, uh, category in these guidance related to supporting the public health response. The next one uh, then gets into addressing the negative impact, economic impacts caused by the public health emergency. And that too has um, multiple subcategories, starting with delivering assistance to workers and families, supporting small businesses, speeding the recovery of the tourism, travel, and hospitality sectors. And the last subcategory in this uh, group is to rebuilding public sector capacity. Those apply in situations where public agency laid employees off due to the pandemic. The uh, next subcategory, uh, or the next category, forgive me, is serving the hardest hit communities and families. Um, here too, there are uh, four different subcategories. The first one is addressing health disparities and the social detriments of health. Second is investments in housing and neighborhoods. Uh, third is addressing educational disparities. Uh, fourth and last is promoting healthy childhood environments. Each one of those subcategories has additional explanations and, and restrictions. The next category is, is replacing lost public sector revenue. This gets into uh, quite a discussion and it establishes how you determine lost public sector revenue and it's an overall general fund revenue. So if you lost revenue in one area, for example, the highway user revenue fund, but you did not lose fund in other areas, and overall the loss of fund does not meet the requirements established, then uh, you, those, uh, you don't, the, an agency uh, is not then allowed to claim that there is a loss of revenue. The next category is providing premium pay for essential workers. And this gets into, among others, and I'm only listing some, not all, but staff at nursing homes, hospitals, and home care settings, public health and safety staff, social service and human services staff, child care workers, educators, and school staff, among others. The, and please know I'll be happy to come back and answer any questions you may have. I'm just going through, it can be a lengthy presentation. I just wanted to summarize it. Next is investing in water and sewer infrastructure. <clears throat> and this is, this is uh, clear as far as uh, what the intent of the law is, and that is um, flood control district project, water, um, you know, potable water projects, sewer uh, uh, projects, sewer installation, sewer treatment, enhancing existing systems, or uh, expanding on them. Uh, in the, and you will see in the other category, but I'll mention it now, other infrastructure projects not related to this water and sewer infrastructures are not and allowed expenditures are not included in this law. Uh, next is next is uh, the last one, which is investing in broadband infrastructure. And um, here again, it gets into uh, details about the long miles, middle mile, and short mile, and knowing what the um, um, uh, plans are for interstates and then within the states and locally obviously so and there are multiple uh, pots um, available for broadband so 
this will truly require a lot of coordination at the um, state and regional level to ensure that uh, we're um, we're coordinated and we're aligned with the uh, overall efforts uh, under the broadband uh, activities. Um, the the next uh, set of uh, comments, I'll call them, are the ineligible uses. And here, uh, it, the law does get very specific. It talks about the first uh, category being um, no recipient may use this funding to make a deposit to a pension fund. That was, uh, that was clear from the beginning uh, and, it can, and is consistently um, explained throughout the law. Um, the the uh, next one is that uh, um, these, these funds may not be used for funding debt service, legal settlement or judgments, and deposit to a rainy day fund or any financial services. Um, and um, last but uh, not least, the, um, the intent, uh, the, these funds are to be used for um, uh, infrastructure projects that are either water, sewer, or bro broadband but uh, are not, uh, no other uses of them are allowed for um, the infrastructure. So before I go on and get into reporting, uh, are there any questions by the board members that I may be able to address or the team that I've been working with of department heads? Uh, we'll do our best to answer any questions you may have. <clears throat> Is this the time for snide comments? So Congress passes out a blue state bailout bill, and then they pass out the rules, or let an, uh, unelected bureaucrats decide what the rules are going to be on this. Once this is just ridiculous. Um, yeah, I'm just going to have to take a look at more of the detail of what you can do and what you cannot do. Um, interesting that. Um, we have bridges. We don't personally have bridges, but there's bridges across the United States that could use repair. Um, road infrastructure is probably one of the more important infrastructures that we have, but that's not, you can't do road work with it, apparently. Apparently, I can fix lead pipes in uh, blue states uh, run by lousy governors and mayors, but uh, we can't fix roads. Thank you. Chairman Johnson? Uh, about roads. So, uh, if I heard you correctly, you said that you, it, it, investing in um, areas that you had a loss of revenue. So is there any way to quantify how much the loss of revenue was to HERF while people were home not driving? Did we see a decline in our HERF money? Um, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Angus, we did see a decline in the month of uh, March and April, and I would even say May. Those were the last months year. of last year. Right. Those were the months that the governor had issued executive order to stay home, stay safe. Right. The, then the, her funds started to rebound and resume and get back closer to normal. I don't have the numbers. We have them. The county has them. I don't have them at okay. my. But would that be a, a legitimate thing to to put back money for the money that we lost because of the the COVID um, stay at home order? Because that's what I think you said to replace loss of revenue. I did say that, Supervisor. It is it is one of the. Uh, Categories that do qualify, it says replacing uh, lost public sector uh, revenue. It truly gets into how you calculate that. And you look at the last three years and you compare your, your, your revenue for this, for the year 2020 to those years, and you assume 4.5% uh, um, increases and so on. So we will be able to calculate and come back to the board with a determination as to whether we we had see and it's not on a 
category by category. So it's not just her fund, it's the overall general fund of 2020 compared to the overall general fund of... So, so what's interesting is that um, getting back to item 56 that we went on and on about, there's a lot of similarities in this because what I'm seeing is the things that we can do because we weren't hard hit. We, you know, and whatever we had, we was taken care of with the CARES money. So if we go along with this uh, idea that we voted on that it goes into our communities, then you know, it seems to me that the best place for some of this money would be in the nonprofits to help these, the, the, the healthcare, the, the economic, you know, even for the business people. So is that something, again, that now we can literally talk about, can we give this to nonprofits to dole over? Do we need to have people come and beg us for it? Um, I, it does make reference to um, small, in one of the categories, it references individuals, small businesses, and nonprofit. Right. How, if indeed it is to go to a nonprofit, we would be obligated. My understanding is, let me just please remind you that this is, to the best of my understanding, what I'm sharing with you is um, a review with department heads. Uh, we all uh, went through and, and uh, prepared for this meeting. So to the, to the best of my understanding, um, the revenue um, funds can be shared with nonprofit, but, the, but it doesn't change the fact that it has to conform with the eligible and non-eligible expenses. Ultimately, we would be responsible for it, supervisor, that is my understanding, and as you will hear when I get into the reporting and um, the uh, recoupment, as, they, as the guidelines call it, or repayment of fund, if it's ineligible, um, it, it's clear that the, that the county remains uh, responsible for the expenditure of those funds. Uh, and the eligibility of them, or on eligible expenditure. Okay. So um, then, with that said, uh, as far as reporting is concerned, and that was one of the items uh, uh, on the uh, agenda that uh, Supervisor Lickefelter asked for. So the, re the re recipients of the ARPA funds. Um, those with a uh, population under 250,000, which is us, Mojave County, uh, must comply, uh, forgive me, must compile a report for those expenditures that are covering from the, uh, when the law was uh, activated or, or enacted into law up and through July 31st. That's next month, at the end of the month. And uh, that would be considered a um, that would be considered an initial report, and it would it has to be uh, compiled and submitted by the uh, by the end of August of this year, and then from there on, reports have to be submitted quarterly based on uh, the expenses, what we're spending funds on, and uh, their eligibility. And that continues until the end of the um, availability uh, period, which is December 31 of 24. Um, recipients will be audited. Failure to comply with these restriction or with the restrictions that are listed and noted is uh, would be deemed ineligible expenditure, subject to repayment or as the guidelines call it recoupment uh, uh, back to the U.S. Treasury. So the guidance uh, related to the recoupment is that they would identify and notice us of any violation. Uh, there would be an opportunity for the recipient, Mojave County in this case, to request um, a reconsideration. And then once that reconsideration is complete, um, any recoupment or repayment would have, to, if indeed it holds and there is a violation, then the repayment would have to be within 120 days of receipt of any final notice of recoupment. 
um, and then I'm almost there. As far as um, the last um, bullet on the agenda item related to staff working with the board to uh, advance um, expenditures, those procedures, we see those as um, uh, as far as the county manager's office and staff uh, w working with the board on projects, programs, or services. Um, projects, program services identified by the board or a board member will be advanced uh, by staff after identifying the scope and the budget, as well as developing a timeline to complete. Uh, staff throughout uh, throughout uh, this law and the implementation of it will be guided by uh, by the following expenditures under this law must be authorized by the Board of Supervisors in accordance with the county practices and policies projects programs and or services will follow county procurement policies and guidelines and finally contracts agreements partnerships uh, must be approved, authorized by the Board of Supervisors for either uh, for either award of contract or execution of an agreement. And I will stop here and will do my best to answer your questions. Supervisor Lingenfeld, you're just looking to give direction to staff to come back with the same thing that the managers told us to deal with each individual. Yes, that, that would be the motion to um, direct the county manager and his staff to work uh, with each county supervisor to allocate their district's one-fifth allocation um, to satisfy unique requirements. I know I can speak to my district. Um, the allowable uses that I would look at, and I'm having a few interim conversations or just initial conversations up in the Colorado City area. You know, you, you talk to Hunter Adams. He's the director of the health clinic up there. With everything that they've been through, there's some uh, mental health needs up there. Um, there's also some water uh, infrastructure projects. Um, being a business owner myself, um, I lean towards infrastructure. You know, I think that uh, water infrastructure, if you invest in that, it, it uh, helps to grow our commercial, our industrial, our residential base. That leads <laughs> to new, a broadened tax base, um, broadband infrastructure. You know, that's used in every area of our life. That benefits everybody, uh, makes our area more competitive in the world. Um, so that's kind of where I lean. Um, and I look forward to working with staff to bring those projects um, to our board for review and approval. But uh, I think it'd be um, just divided up similar to how we do the community development block grant funding. Um, each one of our supervisors, I think, is um, they know their district better than anybody, the unique needs there, and uh, I, I think that would be an easier way to, to do it, um, to allow and depend upon the district supervisor to bring us those projects than to get everybody into a room and to start horse trading. It's going to be a long process, and I'll tell you what, if that's the way we would go, I, you're not going to get me to vote um, to broaden or grow government with any of these funds. I'm going to be 100% infrastructure for my vote. So that's all I have. Thank you. Do you have a motion then? Yes, I do. I direct the county manager and staff to work with the, each county supervisor to allocate their district's one-fifth allocation of the American Recovery Act funding to satisfy specific public needs within each of the Mojave County's five unique supervisor districts. Second. Discussion. A motion and a second. Discussion. Um, <laughs> you know, when we first voted on this uh, way to divvy up this money, I, I did think it was a little premature, but as we hear more about how really little we can do with it, I mean, there was a time we thought we could build buildings or do stuff, but there, we really can't. So at this point, I do think it would be best served within our own communities to do what the intent is, to help the people, not to help the government. So uh, I'm, all, I'm all for it now. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Chairman aye. Johnson. Aye. Any opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Chairman Johnson, I, I didn't vote yet. I, I, I just I'm have sorry. one comment. If, sure. if we can just back out of that vote real quick. It's backed up. OK. OK, uh, my thought uh, initially was it was premature. And I didn't like the idea of dividing the uh, 
the funds in uh, in fifths for each district because I believe that this is uh, money that can benefit Mojave County and and I still think that we should be looking at projects that benefit the entire county, not just each district, because then the the power that we have with forty million dollars is diminished uh, by five times. So, I I would like staff to take a look at projects, infrastructure projects uh, that would benefit the entire county, such as uh, water and and sewer and uh, and uh, broadband. I mean, those are issues that the entire county would benefit from. And it would make the, the bookkeeping so much easier when we report back how we spent this money. Um, of course, if, if uh, Supervisor Lincoln Felter wants to still go district by district, uh, it, it could be done. But I, I just really would like to see us take this on as a county project and, and trust our staff to make it fair within all five districts uh, within a reason. I, I think when staff meets with with each of us, I think if, like, say, you were interested in broadband, and and they would come back and say, well, obviously to make this work, we need money, and and we should have every district involved. I, I think that'll probably should be addressed in there. I think so. Yes. All right. Item number sixty-eight. Do you have a substitute resolution, Supervisor Bishop? Um. Uh, Chairman Johnson, just a point of order, real quick. So we did vote on 67. Yes. Okay, just to make sure, because you said there we backed up. I was well, I, I didn't vote, so I, I asked that I be able to comment before the vote. So do we need to want you want to take the vote again, just to be sure? No, we got the, it, we got the vote in. She just actually, I, I'd like to know if uh, Supervisor Lingenfelter would consider uh, rewording his his motion to make it more of a, a county project. Is anybody interested in reconsidering item number 67? We'll do it that way. Thank you. Yes. You didn't, you didn't vote, so. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. You don't get a chance. So the, the re reconsideration dies. We can move, for, we can move right. forward. Thank you. Okay. All right. Supervisor Bishop, do you have a substitute uh, resolution for item number 68? Yes, I'd like to... Uh, make a substitute motion that we direct staff to uh, look at the American Recovery Act funding uh, for Mojave County overall. Uh, no, I'm 68 for your resolution for uh, 2021, the, I'm on the right number, right? Dedication of the fuel. Chairman Johnson, Supervisor Bishop, um, 67 was already decided and it was not reconsidered. So the vote moved forward as a, a four to zero. You're just noted as not voting. Okay. Now we're on item 68. All right, I stand corrected. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Okay, item 68. Mr. Chairman, I would like to note that the resolution uh, before us today has been revised from the initial direction that was to use a portion of the 50 cent per gallon alternative tax credit. Um, I'd like to read the revised resolution into the record and then have Director Ursenbach introduce Mr. Tom Turin, uh, Chairman of Nacero, who's in the audience with us today, and he's prepared to answer any questions the board may have. Um, I have one question first. Supervisor Gould. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is, is this merely a resolution, or are we, is the county somehow involved in who gets the 50 cent uh, income tax credit on alternative, supposedly clean air fuels? I thought this was just a resolution. I don't think the, the county has a say in that latter part that you're saying. I, I thought it was just a resolution supporting the, supporting the idea. That's correct. It's not how it's written. In the agenda, it's not written as a resolution. It's written as an item. Did you receive a copy of the, reser of the revised resolution from the clerk of the board? I received that copy when I was here today. The information that I obtained in regards to the agenda item was general information on the tax credit. Hey, Mr. Chairman, if I could read the resolution into the record. Supervisor Bishop. 
So this is a resolution of the Mojave County Board of Supervisors supporting federal tax credits and other actions that would support and accelerate development of the proposed Nacero low carbon zero sulfur gasoline manufacturing plant in Mojave County. Whereas the Board of Supervisors met in regular session the seventh day of June 2021, and whereas Nacero Incorporated has announced its intention to build a $6 billion facility near Kingman, Arizona to produce gasoline from natural gas and renewable natural gas, and whereas it is projected that the Mojave County project will create 3,500 construction jobs during the four years of construction and 350 permanent high paying operating jobs with benefits in Mojave County. And whereas Nacero Incorporated will create gasoline from natural gas and renewable natural gas using the Haldor Topso Tigus system. And whereas the Seidman Institute of the Arizona State University has forecast that the proposed Nacero Mojave County facility will add 13 billion to the economy of the state of Arizona, much of it in Mojave County during its first 40 years of operation. And whereas Nacero gasoline will have half of the life cycle carbon footprint of traditional gasoline because it will avoid the production of crude oil byproducts and can have a net zero carbon footprint through the inclusion of the captured renewable natural gas from farms, feedlots, landfills, and avoided flare gas. And whereas the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality has found that zero sulfur gasoline will materially reduce ground level ozone, a pollutant that is causing illness and restricting economic growth in Arizona. And whereas Nacero Incorporated, gasoline will be usable in today's cars and trucks without modification and sold locally in addition to being distributed widely. And whereas Nacero Incorporated will utilize local partnerships for training, including Arizona at Works and Mojave Community College. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Supervisors of Mojave County do hereby urge Arizona elected federal officials to do everything in their power to encourage Congress and the executive branch to support tax credits and other actions, as will encourage and accelerate the start of the construction of Nacero's proposed Mojave County facility. So um, Nacero is, is looking for overall support from Mojave County, uh, from our federal elected officials to move forward on any bills that would support their product. So that's, uh, that's the revised um, resolution that uh, I would ask the, the board to approve. Do we have questions? Right. Supervisor Gould. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I do not support um, tax credits because they create a distortion in the free market. Um, I support the um, Nacero coming to the county, but I just have an overall policy that I think that tax credits are when government picks winners and losers and uses those tax credits to fulfill their misguided policies. So I'll have to vote no. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question of Mr. Lucero. Is that his name? Um, yes. Could could I have uh, Tammy Ersenbach uh, introduce Mr. Uh, Tom Turin? He's the chairman of Nacero. Hi. This is a program we've been working on and project we've been working on for quite a while, shortly after I started. It will bring, as you heard, several jobs into the community and definitely be able to help the cars that we have now without having to convert all of those over to electric cars, which is a long process down the road. I don't see that actually happening for many, many years. But um, with that, um, the person that really understands it a little bit more is Mr. Tom Turing. And he is, um, this will not be the first project. We will be the third project. So it's not something that's going to happen right away either. But he is here today. He's, he flew in to Phoenix last night and drove up this morning so that we could have him come and not only talk about the project, but to answer any of your questions. Tom? Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, sir. The, the question I would have is, is this fuel compatible with the uh, vehicles that are on the road today? It is. It's just gasoline. It'll work just exactly, it, it's exactly just gasoline. So it's usable in today's cars and trucks without modification. Okay, so there won't be any little thing on my manual that says don't use this kind of fuel? No, you just put it in your car. Okay, 
Yeah, that that was the only question I had. It'll be it'll be cost competitive as well. Um, we'll be making two fuels. One will be our blue fuel, um, which uh, which we made from natural gas. We'll have 100% uh, renewable electricity um, uh, at our first facility in Texas, which we intend to start construction on uh, before the end of this year. Uh, we'll have carbon capture as well uh, because there's a, 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 a CO2 pipeline that runs through our site. Um, we'll also be making a green gasoline, which will have a zero carbon footprint. And we'll do that by including in the feedstock renewable natural gas that's uh, otherwise fugitive. Methane, of course, is far more damaging in the environment, 80 times more damaging in the environment over 20 years than carbon dioxide. And so this will produce an additional source of income for farms, feedlots, landfills, um, uh, which we'll capture and then include in, in, our, in our feedstock very powerful uh, impact on, on, the, on the, uh, the carbon impact of, of the gasoline. It'll, it'll actually be ne negative in some instances. Um, Supervisor Gould brought up a, a good point. Obviously, all we're doing is making a recommendation for people to take a look at it um, at, at the federal level. Um, but what, why would the company need a tax credit, and who gets that tax credit? Well, it's a big question, and, and it's an appropriate one. Um, the measure that was discussed in the resolution that was initially before you is an existing measure. It's just not very well clearly written. We think we probably qualify for it. It's a 2005 measure. Uh, it's still on the books. Uh, that measure provides a 50 cent uh, tax credit for all domestically produced alternative fuels. And the, and the objective of that when it was adopted in 2005 uh, was to prevent or reduce a, a reliance on foreign oil. Um, the, the, it was during the, the fuel crisis uh, back then. Um, we have, for example, California is the third largest gasoline market in the world huge amount of production. 70% of the crude oil that's used to make that gasoline is imported. Um, surprisingly, on the East Coast, it's the same. We export about as much crude oil as we import in the United States, even though we have tremendous production. And the reason for that is that uh, the, the crude oil that we produce here is not suitable for gasoline, too much sulfur in it. So we import from everywhere else. The 2005 measure was designed to reduce reliance on those impacts. We use 100% domestic natural, feed, natural gas, domestic feedstock. So it's directly in line with the purpose. The regulations that were adopted by the Department of Energy under that measure include uh, gasoline fuels, motor fuels uh, made from natural gas. The statute has a quirky thing in it. Uh, that could raise some questions, so we want to clarify that. We're, uh, we're uh, getting ready to meet with the Internal Revenue Service right now. Uh, we may be able to do this with a private letter ruling. Uh, it may take no more than that or a simple amendment. Now, beyond that, there's a tremendous amount of stuff going on in Congress right now, as you all know. Um, and there are measures to in, and there's, right now there's particular attention on fugitive methane. Uh, we want to make sure that we're included in those. Um, we're starting our first facility in Texas. Of our first three, um, Kingman is, is, we call it Kingman, it's not exactly Kingman. Uh, Mojave County is, is, uh, is in the first, our first three projects. Um, these measures that are being passed federally uh, will allow us to accelerate development. It's our hope that we could start here in two years. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a major project. It's an anchor industry. We pay very high wages for the, for the area um, and produce a lot of employment, certainly in, in building it. Um, but basically what we would, the, the, the gravamen of, of, of this request 
is to know that the county supports this and that if there are programs uh, to advantage this kind of development that they cover here. We don't want to get caught in the, in the, in the confusion that was in that alternative fuel uh, tax mixture, mixture uh, statute. Uh, we want them to be drafted clearly. Right. I, I, I agree with Supervisor Gould, but just like you said, that this is from 19 or 2005 or 2006, there's no reason why your company shouldn't be uh, included in this, so I'll be supporting Supervisor Lingenfeld. Thank you, Chairman Johnson. Uh, Mr. Trina, I just want to say thank you for coming to Mojave County. Thank you for your interest in Mojave County and the Kingman area. Um, you know, I know that uh, the Biden administration wants to go out and buy us all Teslas to drive, and maybe that'll be included in the next stimulus package. I don't know, but we'll have to wait and see. But uh, until that time, you know, I think um, projects like yours um, kind of fall in that middle ground between um, dependence on oil. You know, the, the, the second to the last whereas got my attention where the gasoline will be usable in today's cars and trucks without modification, sold locally. You also mentioned that there's, it was going to be competitive. Um, so I'm glad that um, we're going to be a part of that. I think that the technology is uh, innovative. I look forward to watching it. The, the interesting thing is the technology is proven. Uh, the system, uh, we have an exclusive relationship with Halder Top, so they're leaders in the world uh, in catalyst and, and refinery operation. Um, it's the only system in the world that's operating. Uh, we will use exactly that same system. It came online two years ago, uh, halfway around the world in Turkmenistan. In Turkmenistan, because it's, it's the, they have the fourth largest natural gas holdings in the world. The Japanese built it, came online on schedule, on budget. Uh, it's performed just fine ever since. So we've got, we don't have the hurdle that you usually have with something transformative in the, the system that we're going to use. Uh, it's fully understood, fully proven, fully operational. <laughs> uh, Bechtel will be building, uh, well, they're building our first one. They're probably going to build all of them. Um, Bechtel is the largest construction company in the U.S., um, very highly regarded. Um, we, um, uh, we, have, we have an excellent, we have, a, uh, I think, 150 of their engineers working for us right now on this project. Um, so we don't, what's amazing about it is that it's so large scale, it can make such a difference, and there, and there are so few obstacles. The first question about does it work in, in existing cars and trucks, usually you do something transformative, you've got to convince people to do something different or to buy something different. We don't have any of that. It just goes in the existing vehicles. Um, we're not policy people. Uh, nobody elected us. You know, we consider ourselves responsible entrepreneurs. We like to do things that are useful. The neat thing about this project is it's whatever we do policy-wise, um, and I have my own doubts as to whether fully electric cars will work in a place like Kingman. Um, it, it's, it's going to be tough to do that. Our, our fuel can essentially erase those cars. We can, it's, it's like taking them off the road um, because we'll have such a dramatic impact. Let me explain. We have, there are two ways in which we affect the carbon impact of, of cars. Um, one is that when you make gasoline from natural gas, you don't produce the byproducts of crude oil refining. It takes two barrels of crude to make one barrel of gasoline. The other barrel is made into a range of byproducts, many of, or some of them that are worth less than the crude oil. They all have to be used. Of the ones that are made, for example, in California, uh, not all of them have a market. In fact, a number of them, a significant percentage of them, do not have a market in California. So we import 70% of the crude oil, and that adds to greenhouse gases. And then we export. We send back halfway around the world these projects like uh, Pet Coke that we don't have a market for uh, here in the United States. So when you make it from, from, from natural gas, you avoid all of that byproduct, unwanted, I'll call it, byproduct production. Um, 
The other way, and that take, that's a, the life cycle comparison, it's about 50% smaller just on the basis of that. Then we'll be able to include this fugitive, captured fugitive methane, and they'll take it down to zero. Um, so it's, 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 it's innovative, certainly, but it's not unproven. Uh, yeah, you know, and it hasn't been mentioned today, but I think uh, from an economic development perspective, um, Nisero will be a, critical, a critically important partner when it comes to foreign trade zone establishment here in Mojave County. And that's something that I believe that we need here, and we've needed here for a long, long time. Well, you know, we had a measure in the state legislature that we pulled uh, to, to put us in, in Class 6. Class 6, if you strip it all away, it's a property tax measure. If you strip it all away, what, it's, what it does is it equalizes the playing field, if you will, for very capital-intensive businesses. Um, if you have, I'll take a law firm, I, used, I practiced law a long time ago. If you have a law firm, your property taxes are a very, very small part of your expenses, um, uh, typically. Um, you can think of many other businesses that don't have a lot of capital investment. When you're building something, you know, $6 billion or $6.5 billion, in the case of this, property tax becomes a huge issue. All of the large scale, uh, industry that's come to Arizona in recent years, to my knowledge, is in Class Six. Is in, and and it it simply makes this, uh, if you will, levels the playing field. Uh, it levels the playing field with other states, but also with other businesses. Um, we thought that we needed an amendment for that, but it turns out we don't. Uh, the foreign trade zone provision uh, will take care of that, and it's. One of the things we, we like to think we pay attention to is bringing as much benefit out of our projects as possible for the, for the locales. Here it will be very beneficial, perfectly beneficial for Kingman to have a, a foreign trade zone here. You know, the, it's, you've done an incredible job with the airport, um, you know, with, 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 with that facility. This will just expand that. Um, so we would, and we would work together to get it. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, we've already scoped out the people, or at least we have some in mind, um, and the process. Um, uh, Bechtel is very adored at, at this as well, and um, I think we'd wind up something of benefit. And it's no big deal to, to have two, one at the airport and, and, and one down at Griffith. The other thing I want to just mention that I'm proud of is that um, our process makes 80% of the water that it needs, literally out of the air. I'm not a chemist, but it's pretty amazing. It's not recycled. Uh, it, it produces 80% of the water that it needs. So our water need for the size capital investment for the returns in the county and that $13 billion that Seidman Institute at ASU talks about, very real, uh, is very small in terms of... And, and, being in, in the Sacramento Aquifer is obviously better. We thought about that carefully in terms of the location. Um, but we'll use uh, about the water, that, our makeup water that we need for that other 20% is about what you would use in a golf course. So it's a way better. I know you don't have a lot of golf courses here, but it's a way better use of water. Um, uh, we're very proud of that aspect of the, of the, of the facility. And we're also excited about the, the, the jobs, the permanent jobs. You know, the, the construction workers, a lot of them are travelers. Uh, some of them will settle. Some of them will stay here. But the permanent workers, I mean, I can imagine that putting 1,000 kids into the schools. Um, and the, the, the benefit to that in the educational system, I think, can be really significant. We're also very interested in... Uh, raising aspirations of kids. We think that having a facility like this proximate that they can see and touch will change their ideas about you know, what they might do, what they might want to study. So we in intend, as much as we're welcome, to be involved, you know, to encourage participation um, in the schools. Uh, we want our guys to be available to lecture. We'll have a, a, a visitor center. There'll be There'll be a viewing platform during construction so people can 
see what's going on. It's a huge site. It's 1,500 acres uh, that we have under option. Um, a lot of that will be solar uh, because we'll have on-site solar for, I believe here, all of our, all of our um, uh, uh, everything we can do with solar, we'll, 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 we'll have the, the uh, on-site facility. I built, uh, Jay McKenna, uh, our, our CEO and I built or developed a, a 250 megawatt solar project, so we're, we're familiar with that business. Um, I don't know that we'll do it ourselves here, but it'll be part of it. Anyway, we're excited about it. I, I, um, when Tammy told me it was going to be on the, on, the, uh, on the agenda today, I said, well, I'll, um, I should come to the meeting. I, I wanted to meet you all. Uh, thank you for all the support you've given us so far. Um, what we're coming up on right now is, is a very rapidly moving uh, uh, political agenda. As you may know, the parliamentarian last week ruled that the Democrats can only use reconciliation one more time. That's going to drive uh, infrastructure probably to a bipartisan solution. Um, we have, um, uh, you know, Senator Sinema is, is quite bipartisan. Um, I know there are a lot of Democrats who think she's a Republican. Um, and um, <laughs> I, she's in a, an interesting position. Um, but um, I met with uh, Senator Capito last week um, in, in Washington. I was a really fine person. She's, a, as you know, the Republican that the president is working most closely with and trying to put something together. Uh, I also had lunch with Senator Manchin. They're an interesting pair. Um, the, uh, but this is all happening very quickly. We, we're, we have a good lobby team. We want to be right on top of whichever way things go to make sure that we're not left out. I mean, that's the nature of that business. That's what, really what this resolution is about, is just saying that the county you know, would like for, for Nacero to build here. They like the idea of the proposal and um, are, are saying, you know, make sure you don't get left out. That's, that's really our, our, our goal here. Our first facility um, is being financed uh, entirely privately. We're beginning the project finance on that uh, this summer. Uh, it's already kicked. It formally begins a little later in the summer. Um, it's not public, but Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley are raising respectively the, the debt and the equity for that project. Uh, it's being very well received. Um, the rest of, of all of this simply goes to competitiveness and our being able to develop quickly. Um, but it's a huge project. It's probably, if you think about our first three or four projects, it may be the largest infrastructure opportunity, industrial infrastructure opportunity in the country at this point. Certainly it's one of them. And our project finance deal will be, if not the largest, one of the very largest in the country this summer. But it's all... We just closed our last uh, development round, um, which was oversubscribed, and they're asking us to do another one right now before we're finished with those. Um, it's, it's really it's quite exciting. Um, but the neat thing is to be able to make this much change in a rural area without it depending on inventing a whole lot of different things, with, without the uncertainties that you normally face in something this large or transformative like this. Um, Howard Stevenson, who is the senior associate dean of the Harvard Business School and created the entrepreneurship program there years ago, he's emeritus now, um, that's what really fascinates him most about this, is that, is that there's, there's so little uncertainty in front of us. And now with Bechtel, you know, I'm, uh, I used to lose sleep at night worrying about the risks in the construction well, I, you know, with, with, with them doing it, I feel much more comfortable. So anyway, please, any questions that you've got, I'm happy to answer them. I wish you the best of luck, and I thank you for making the trip up. I tend to run on, so if I go too long, just tell me to stop. I did have a person from the audience that signed up. Is Katie Manning here still? I'm sorry? I, I had a lady signed up that wanted to speak on this item, so... Thank you. Thank you.
Good afternoon, Supervisor Johnson and Board of Supervisors. My name is Katie Manning, 3941 East Ames Avenue, Kingman, Arizona. Uh, I'm a bit concerned with Nacero. A year ago, in March, it was announced in Casa Grande they were going to put their big plant. Okay, it was pulled March of this year. Why? And now they want to use Kingman. I'm looking at it from a groundwater standpoint of view and growing up in Southern California and Long Beach and natural gas and pollution, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What is it that they really want? Do they really want our water? Do they want to mess with the pollution here? Sounds wonderful, pie in the sky. And he's selling something really wonderful. But is it really for us, for our county, what is totally involved? Having lots of workers is great. Having an economy coming in, that's great. What sort of funding do they have? This is ground level. And right off the get-go, we're going to dedicate 50 cents to this before we have total approval on any of it at any level? What they're building in Texas, what do we know about? Why did they pull out of Casa Grande? Do we know? No. We need to ask some hard questions. And I would really prefer that you table this today for further information and investigation as to what can be done. I think at this point, it's a little bit of the cart before the horse. So that ends my comment. And my other thought is, is all of you, if you could take these or turn the sound up and put these directly in front of you when you speak. Hildy comes across great. Travis does. The three of you do not, and neither do you. And we all speak in lower tones, but it would be nice to hear all the words. So thank you very much. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? Supervisor, or uh, Chairman Johnson. Supervisor Bishop. I would like to uh, ask the, the Chairman of Nisero to come back and uh, explain the reasoning why Casa Grande was uh, eliminated out of the uh, process. And also, uh, I think the audience would be interested in knowing why you did choose Kingman. And sure. I know the answers to those questions, but if you could share them with, with the rest of the board and the audience watching on video. I kinda, it, it broke my heart to have to pull out of Casa Grande. Uh, we made a lot of friends there. Uh, I think we left on very good terms. We left them with a 1,000-acre industrial park uh, that they needed. Uh, th there's a lot of economic development there, industrial development, and they kind of run out of, of industrial land. So we turned over all of our... Uh, all the work that we had done in putting that together, the development work. Uh, very simple reason we needed, we didn't have enough natural gas. As we got into the analysis um, uh, and further into the engineering, it just became apparent that there, there wasn't enough natural gas. We would have needed to build a 100-mile lateral uh, to provide natural gas. And part of our approach to doing this is to use existing infrastructure w whenever possible. Um, Kingman was on our, in our sites early. We, we, we came to Casa Grande kind of by an accident, but that's another story. Uh, we, it, it, was the, it was the lack of, of pipeline capacity, existing pipeline capacity that was the problem there. Um, we were very well received. We had a great relationship with the government officials there um, and um, felt very welcome in that community. We had, we had a very good site. This one is better. It's, it's further away from things yet. Um, we think it's ideal. This is a perfect lo a location in the West for natural gas pipeline capacity. And the natural gas will, will come from the Permian, or come, pr come from Texas. Uh, some will, may come from the Rockies here as well. But what we did was we overbuilt the natural gas pipeline capacity going West thinking that we were going to change from coal to natural gas for electricity production, not for seeing renewables. So there's a lot of capacity, existing capacity here. That's why the power plant is, is in Griffith. 
It's it's the same reason that we're looking at, the, at that location is that it has adequate uh, abundant uh, natural gas pipeline capacity. It's also right on the rail, which is important to us. There was a siding there. We have that under option. We'll restore that siding. Uh, the rail is important to us. Uh, but it's really, it's the, uh, and, and for the same reason that, that uh, Kingman makes sense as a transportation hub, now, all the work you've done at the airport, it's, it, again, it's very well located in terms of the Southwest. Um, we can distribute from here in, in good fashion. Um, so it, reluctantly, we, it was an important, it, in a, it's hard to make a decision like that um, because you, we'd spent a lot of money developing it. But the truth is the bulk of the money that we had spent there was, was on engineering and development, stuff that, was, that translates to our other projects. Our, our whole approach is to design one and build many. And so it, that replicates pretty well. The money that we spent developing the site, well, that went to, to the municipality. I think they've already got somebody else signed up for a portion of it. So that's the answer to that one. I'm sorry, what was the other question? Um, just, just the attraction to, uh, to the location that you... Kingman, Kingman is an ideal location for what we're doing in the Southwest. Um, I mean, it's, this, is, uh, this fuel will get distributed. Uh, some will go to California, some to Nevada. A lot of it will stay in Arizona. Um, it's, 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 but it's, again, it's mostly the pipeline infrastructure. We don't, interestingly, what we don't have is a crude oil pipeline from, from the heartland to the West Coast. That's why all of that, a big reason why, why so much of that crude oil in Texas is imported. Because there is no no, no uh, connection to any of the other oil fields. Okay, well, thank you very much. Any and other I questions? I certainly want to thank you for traveling to Kingman and addressing the board personally. I, I certainly uh, appreciate having the information, and, uh, and we Listen. welcome you to Mojave County in less than two years, hopefully. And Look, uh, this is this is a big deal. Uh, we. It's like uh, divorce. It's like marriage without possibility of divorce. You you spend six billion dollars in a, in a place you can't move it. So the, the, you really need to, you know. And members of the community who've got questions, we owe it to them to address them. And by the way, this this is not in my mind cart before the horse. Oh, that's a good question. This is a first step. We have to go through full permitting. Uh, all of that is in front of us. And that's what the permitting process is about. This is just creating eligibility, if you will, to start that process. Um, but something like this needs to be looked at. It needs to be understood in the community. needs to be carefully approved. That's, that, that's coming next. Thank you. Okay. Here we have a resolution in front of us. Mr. Chairman, if I might, I move that we approve the Mojave County Resolution Number 2021-082, supporting the federal tax credits and other actions that would support and accelerate development of the proposed Acero Low Carbon Zero Sulfur Manufacturing Plant in Mojave County. A second. Second. Motion and second for the discussion. Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign? No. Motion carries. Item number 70 is a short one from our public health director. Chairman Johnson, members of the board, thank you. I'll go through some of my information pretty quickly here, and then if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer those. I'll go through some general information. At this point, we've had 20,876 cases to date. That's about 400 more than last month. Ever hospitalized, 2,069, about 20 plus more than a month ago. Deaths, 642, that's 22 additional deaths since a month ago. Recovered, 17,762 individuals. Uh, average age of case continues to be right around 47 years old, 48. 
Average age of death, <clears throat> just under 75. Um, our population ever with COVID, based on the number of cases, is 9.7%. And the percent of pos uh, tests that were positive during the entire ep uh, epidemic has been 15.3%. Um, our vaccine uh, coverage so far has um, been creeping along. Uh, just to be clear, there's an abundance of vaccine in the community, and um, it's available at most pharmacies, if not all pharmacies, including private physicians' offices. Um, and that number continues to grow, although very small at this point. But eventually, that will be the primary point of contact for those individuals getting vaccine, will be all through their pharmacies, very similar to how uh, we've seen uh, flu roll out in terms of the vaccine in those locations. Um, any questions? The only question I have is um, now that we've gotten so many people vaccinated, that kind of the numbers actually are going are about the same as they were before because we have you know, as far as people getting the COVID? Actually, our numbers went up ever so slightly in this last uh, couple of weeks. So two weeks ago, uh, we had a total of 59 cases. La previous, or uh, the week after that, it was 90, and this week, we, or last week, we were up to 108. So we're kind of swinging back on an upswing. It's certainly not dramatic, as you know, like what we've seen in the past, but there is a, it has been a, a modest increase in cases over the last three weeks. Are there any other questions? Supervisor Angus. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Supervisor. I have to ask. Sure. <laughs> okay. Given the revelations of this week with the revered Dr. Fauci, as a public health official, do you feel a little betrayed? You know, you rarely have all the background story for everything. You rarely get the full story in the media. And I hesitate to, I mean, I haven't read a lot of the media for that exact reason. Because I know I it's a loaded get, question. I, it is, and, and I and I can it. appreciate your position there. I really can. I just uh, before I make decisions, I prefer to have as much information as I right. can, and I have to look at both sides of those issues. And I haven't seen both sides quite yet. Okay. And the questions. That's it. We're adjourned. Thank you, everybody, for sticking with us.